Those who know what the original Xbox startup melody sounded like are more than likely very familiar with the orchestral hum that hailed in the birth of a new competitor in the ongoing phenomenon referred to by many early gaming journalists as the console wars. While the sounds of the Master Chief obliterating alien life rippled through old tube TVs across the world, a similar rippling effect caused the Xbox to catapult Microsoft into becoming a real competitor to Sony and Nintendo. Halo had become a household name, its first entry spawning a multi-billion dollar franchise consisting of books, games, collectibles, and a mysterious fourth thing that definitely didn't suck. Bungie had made it. Its humble roots and experimentation in tank battle shooters, real-time tactics games, first-person shooters, and online multiplayer paying off in a monumental way. Promotional products for later entries began to pop up everywhere, from movie theaters playing trailers of Halo 2 before films, to a Microsoft executive getting its release date tattooed on his bicep. A council of celebrities and musicians were handpicked to represent Hollywood's thinly veiled role in advertising for the second entry. Microsoft's goal of getting its series to become less of a game and more of a cultural icon further shoving Halo into the spotlight. The third game received even more publicity and for good reason. Microsoft spent over $40 million in marketing. I mean, uh, because the last two were so great. So great were they, in fact, that Pepsi introduced Mountain Dew Game Fuel into the world. Collectible toys and games were pressed into existence as part of the pre-release hype. One of the race cars in the Dover 400 was adorned with the game's title on its hood. Burger King and 7-Eleven sold their food and drinks wrapped in Halo-themed cosmetics. It was an industry-fueled renaissance of promotion and hype, with the tagline urging the masses to finish the fight. And the fight was indeed finished in 2007, the final game of the trilogy sending off Bungie's six-year sprint to the finish line with flying colors. Well, until 2009 when ODST came out and 2010 when Reach released, and 2012 when Halo 4 was pinched out by 343 Industries. Hmm, I wonder why a series with all this marketing power behind it won't just die even though the original developers moved on. I was in fourth grade when my best friend invited me over to his house to show off his fancy new black box with a green circle on it. I was a Nintendo kid who had recently started dabbling in the PS2 and had no idea what this bulky hunk of machine was. But my main takeaway from my sleepover was that it was a Halo playing machine, which is exactly why I had to have it for Christmas that year. I didn't care what else it did, I knew that this was the only way that I could shoot aliens or my friends in a delightful little map called Blood Gulch. It was Halo that had me lining up for my first ever midnight release of a game. It was Halo that caused me to buy an Xbox One and eventually regret that purchase when I switched to mostly PC gaming. I've played these games a lot, the series responsible for many late night co-oping with friends on legendary difficulty and queuing up for lobbies with loud open mics littered with swearing and casual racism. But there's something about growing up with a franchise that really makes it harder to analyze, to figure out which parts are good and which might not be so good, what worked and what didn't. Are these games something that I just have a blind nostalgia for? Are they really that great? Yeah, probably. But I still want to peer into them a little harder. To take a look at Bungie's original vision before the prequels, the spin-offs, the TV shows, and the 343 games. So in this video, I'll be taking a look at the stories, the level designs, and the gameplay mechanics of the first three Halo games, and seeing what they did well, and what doesn't really stand up today. It's worth mentioning that Halo has a metric load of written lore to it, and has obviously been padded by these books. I'm not the biggest Halo lore nerd just because my focus was on the games, so I'm going to try my best to stick with what's presented in them while filling in with extra info from the books when necessary. Before I begin, I'll note that I have a sponsor with BetterHelp around the 40 or so minute mark, right after I'm done with the first game, so try not to be too alarmed. Okay, so let's start with Halo Combat Evolved. Bungie's 2001 release almost seemed like a formality with the process that it went through to becoming an Xbox exclusive. For context, Bungie had two standout series before Halo, Marathon and Myth. These series were the bread and butter of the studio, touting a cult following that gave Bungie its start as a respectable developer. Halo Combat Evolved took the lessons learned throughout their time with these games and used it to refine and polish their new sci-fi entry into something that they could be proud of. A physics engine with a focus on realism was their cornerstone in this endeavor, and fun-to-traverse environments followed suit. 
with the game initially falling into the RTS category. Now you can see where Halo Wars came from. When it became apparent that keeping focus on one individual unit and driving vehicles manually made for a more fun experience, it wasn't long before Halo was refocused into a third-person shooter. This is where things got fun. You see, Bungie's focus had always been on development for the Mac. In fact, Halo was first publicly revealed by Steve Jobs at Macworld Expo in 1999. But this is one of the coolest I've ever seen. This game is gonna ship early next year from Bungie, and this is the first time anybody has ever seen it. It's the first time they've debuted it. And the Halo Project lead, Halo is the name of this game, and we're gonna see, for the first time, Halo. Welcome, Jason. Halo. Combat evolved. Yeah, Bungie had some monetary issues happening after one of their previous games sometimes, uh, erased people's hard drives. Just a silly little goof up. One that cost the developer $800,000, which was like $10 billion in 2000. Or something like that. So yeah, Bungie was scrambling, and this was one of the moves that they had to make to survive. I mean, it kind of worked out. The game released as a first-person shooter to nearly perfect scores across the board, cementing its place on the Xbox and creating the start of a legacy. But enough with the preamble, let's get into the game. It's worth noting that I don't really worry about comparing graphics to today's standards because I find that to be pretty stupid. So I'll be playing with the Anniversary Edition just so we have something nice to look at. Oh, also I'll be playing on Heroic Difficulty because, um, I don't really feel like having to deal with Halo 2's Legendary Difficulty specifically. So the first game kicks off after the events of Halo Reach, a prequel that came out at the end of Bungie's time with the series. I'll get to that sometime if people are into this video. The year is 2552, and humanity has been at war with an alien race called the Covenant. While many events have occurred to get to this point, the here and now centers on a United Nations Space Command vessel known as the Pillar of Autumn. As the ship drops out of slip space, it's immediately fired upon by Covenant ships, which seem to have intercepted our course and arrived sooner. As the enemy begins boarding the Autumn, Captain Keys decides to wake up the ship's hidden weapon, John 117, better known as the Master Chief. The title refers to John's rank of Master Chief Petty Officer, the highest enlisted rank in the UNSC. What it doesn't refer to is the fact that the Master Chief is a super soldier, one created through humanity's Spartan II program. There are heaps of supplementary information that can be discovered outside of these games, but Bungie's focus was pretty clear when they cut straight to the point with the original trilogy. Here's the Master Chief. He's a faceless, deep-voiced, seven-foot-tall badass. Here's the Covenant. It's a unified force of religious aliens. Go kick their asses. And that was probably the best thing that you could focus on when trying to win people over to a brand new universe on a brand new console. I love exposition as much as the next guy, but I admit that I probably wouldn't have gotten into Halo had there been a 12 minute introductory cutscene followed by a background of John Halo growing up and going through the process of becoming a superhuman. Instead, you're woken up and told to go meet with the Captain as the Covenant begin boarding the Pillar of Autumn in droves. Maneuvering over to Keys is your movement tutorial, seeing as our leadership didn't think to outfit the Chief with any sort of weapon. Yeah, it's a bit gamey, unfortunately, but you at least get to catch your first glimpses of what the Covenant look like, and the plasma-based weapons that they utilize on the crew here. While I navigate the twists and turns of the autumn like an old friend, I do recall getting lost quite a few times when I was a kid. Kind of funny how these little green lights and floor paint didn't stick out to me as something to follow back then. Getting to Keys has him deciding to issue the order to abandon ship. His immediate goal is to protect the ship's AI, Cortana. As he puts it, if they lose her to the Covenant, the enemy will learn all sorts of inside information, including the location of Earth. Earth. So we slot her into our suit, and now we have our own little chat GPT in our head. Keys helpfully gives us an empty pistol for some fucking reason, and off we go on our escape mission. The first level to grace the series is actually super cleverly designed. For those fresh to the series, a degree of caution is naturally going to take hold, causing the average player to stick to cover, aim for headshots, and try to avoid grenades as they're hurled in your direction. If you're playing at a higher difficulty or just have less experience in general, you're apt to die pretty easily. Fortunately, checkpoints grace you throughout this endeavor, 
and that's where the design of the Pillar of Autumn becomes a lot more in-depth. While a new player will likely get lost in its twisting hallways, it becomes clear pretty quickly that many of the hall's exits lead to different points of the battle. You could come out on the side of the Marines here, who are doing their best against the Covenant threat. You could pop out right between the two, inserting yourself into the chaos directly. Or you could bum rush the Covenant, tossing grenades at them when they're least expecting it and disrupting them while the Marines hammer them with assault rifles. The last route is particularly fun if you have a grip on the game's combat and understand how everything works. But for those still exploring, these other options could be a bit more friendly depending on your approach. It's really good to help the player to understand just how they want to engage in combat. And I have to hand it to Bungie for designing a pretty great introductory level for the player. In terms of human weapons, we have our standard assault rifle, which fires very fast but weak rounds. And we have our aforementioned pistol, which is probably my favorite weapon in the game. I'm definitely not alone in that. There's something to be said about being able to one-shot kill any unshielded enemy in the game and having a 2x zoom on a gun that doesn't have a scope attached to it. Additionally, you have a few Covenant weapons in the Plasma Pistol and the Plasma Rifle. The pistol in particular is great at eviscerating enemy shields, which makes following it up with a melee attack or the Assault Rifle a deadly combo. The rifle on the other hand is okay and is probably slightly worse than the Assault Rifle. In my opinion. I'm sure somebody out there is going to have a fucking opinion on that. It's one of those weapons that you pick up when you're out of ammo and are in a pinch. It's hard to say that there's an outright bad gun in this game, as all of them seem to have a purpose if you know what they're best at. Plasma weapons are great for destroying shields, while kinetic weapons are good for securing the kill. Both can be used inversely, but knowing what you're doing will get the best performance out of them. Of course, if you're good at aiming and moving, you can make a lot of loadouts work for you regardless of what they're best at. It's a fantastic system that makes trying out different options a fun experience. And it's easy to see how Halo revolutionized the first-person shooter with features like these. When you make it to the end of the first level, it's time to take the escape pod down to this large ring thing in front of us. I don't know what it's called. Some kind of big disc. Crashing into it with our posse of soldiers winds up with all of them dead besides the chief, who now has to get to work trying to rendezvous with any survivors. This will definitely come from a place of bias, but I love how replayable this game is just from a sheer experience point of view. With the first level, just knowing how the hallway system works is a huge leap in knowledge when it comes to navigating to each bit of the ship. With the second, knowing how wide open terrain can be capitalized on will transform your whole experience. When I first played, I would always sneak at the start of this area. And you can do that, eluding the incoming Covenant forces and sauntering slowly towards any ground troops. But you can also just zip up the side, maybe taking a few unlucky shots through the sparse tree line from the random banshees which patrol the wreckage of your escape pod. Stealth is quite doable for much of this game, as enemies don't tend to know where you are until you make yourself known. At the same time though, running and gunning is completely feasible as long as you're wary of grenades and keep an eye out for potential cover along the way. Grenades are king in flushing out enemies, and being liberal with your munitions is a completely viable style of play that will have you swapping weapons when need be, as long as you can keep moving from safe spot to safe spot. Even now, Halo is a fantastic iteration of the genre, and even though it shows its age sometimes, it's an enjoyable experience. Following the narrative has you making it to several points around the area and protecting the Marines that have landed here until evac arrives. Meaning, once you've killed everything. You gain access to the first vehicle in the game here, the Warthog. As iconic as it is, I've always felt the Warthog to be a much more fun multiplayer or co-op vehicle. Driving it is fine, but it doesn't move at an incredible speed, and it's 90% less useful without an NPC gunning on the back. If they die, it's just kind of a means of transportation with the occasional opportunity to run an enemy over. You can have the NPCs drive it while you gun, but you're straight up dead if they steer wrong or die while driving. And they always steer wrong at some point. In true old school game design fashion, blinking beacons light your way to the next zone. And when that's not enough, the devs decided to plop some enemies just outside the region that you're looking to hit next. By now, the main Covenant forces have been laid bare, with small grunts, larger elites, and shielded jackals making up your main enemy variety. Each had their own behavior, which I think played a key role in helping the game stand out more. Obviously, each of these enemy types are a different alien race. 
I'm telling that to my 10 year old self in the hopes that the message reaches me somehow. Because I thought that grunts were just children that grew up into jackals which then grew up into elites. Look, I wasn't the brightest kid. But the bigger takeaway here is the behavioral difference between these races. I mean, it's just fucking cool to see, even today. Grunts are silly little guys who exhibit the most colorful behavior. They'll go from brave and charging, to scared and running, to deciding to run at you with active grenades in each hand at the drop of a hat. They'll change their behavior depending on how the battle is going on their end, and even wind up napping in later levels. The elites, on the other hand, are always aggressive and always patrolling or watching out for you. Actually, sometimes they kind of saunter around a little bit. They have like little walks that they do, but that's not too frequent. They're apt to try to punch you when you get too close and get even more pissed off when their shield breaks, giving you a chance to smash them while they're shaking around. And jackals are probably the least flexible in terms of behavior, opting to hold their shields up in front of them at nearly all times when they're on alert. I feel like if the main difference between these enemies was simply more health or weapon variety, then Halo would have been a lot less exciting. Maybe it wouldn't have been a deal breaker, but it definitely wouldn't have been as charming. Our two new weapons in the second level include the Needler and the Sniper Rifle. The Needler is fun because it fires out little homing missiles that explode after a few seconds. Not the most useful, but great on Legendary just because you can play it safe behind cover after unloading a barrage into an Elite. The sniper rifle, on the other hand, is my second favorite weapon in the game. There's something to be said about being able to one-shot kill nearly any enemy in the game and having a 4x zoom on a gun that does have a scope attached to it. When you're through with your rescue ops, you're given a different, more important rescue op. In this case, it's saving Captain Keys from a Covenant cruiser called the Truth and Reconciliation. Man, these guys came up with some cool-ass ship names. What I want to know here is why we're doing this. I mean, yeah, always good to rescue a high-ranking officer, but it doesn't seem like this order came down from the top brass or anything like that. I guess we're just part of this unit, and the captain was our captain, so we might as well go get him. This just seems like one of those things where you go and report to the commander and say, hey, there's a lot of fucked shit here, we need some ships, but whatever. This whole jumping ship thing was to keep Cortana out of enemy hands. And now we're listening to Cortana tell us to throw ourselves dick first into danger to rescue the guy who told us to get away from the ship. I don't know, you would think she would prioritize her own safety here instead of going back for the guy who she obeyed when she was told to abandon him. Well, whatever. The third mission takes that stealth aspect and cranks it to 11, having you creep along a canyon and pick off enemies with the sniper rifle. If you grab the active camo power-up, you can do this without drawing any attention to yourself, which is even cooler. The final Covenant enemy makes itself known after you make it to the Truth and Reconciliation, the Hunter. These guys were always my favorite just because of how intense they make the game. They were also the only Covenant enemy I considered to be a different species due to how different they looked and how they bled orange specifically. I believe the old player's guides likened them to a can of worms, making them even stranger. Halopedia refers to them as a colony of sentient eels which have banded together into a 12-foot tall, 10,000-pound writhing mass. They're these big, raging, brutish creatures that either fire at you with blasts of incendiary gel or try to smash you with big plates that they lug around. They're fucking awesome. That said, they aren't that bad when they get distracted by other marines because their main weak point is in their back. Making it to the ship has you getting rushed by camouflaged elites with big glowing swords, a staple that will be popping up more frequently as the series goes on. Sword always beats gun, so it's best to not get hit by them if you can avoid it. Anyways, this level is fucking tough. Even when I knew what was coming, I had difficulties at nearly all times throughout it. It's the first level that takes the mindset of, wow, I'm a superhero who can destroy anything, and flips it on its head, making you feel even more heroic when you do defy the odds. A big part of it is the sheer amount of enemies, sure, but I think even more than that is the fact that the Covenant will rush you from all angles. They'll use the high ground that you can't feasibly get up to without progressing further. They'll toss grenades when you think you've found a moment to recharge your shields. It's brutal, but it doesn't feel like the enemy is cheating by any means. Just that they're using what they've got on a ship that's their own territory. This is when the game feels the most intense and rewards you for choosing good paths through enemies, finding cover when necessary, and placing your shots well. Jackals are liable to break your shield instantly with a charged shot, making them a priority when there isn't an elite near them. Elites warrant a degree of caution as charging them with a rifle will likely get you killed or close to it. 
Every enemy has a degree of strategy when approaching them, and sometimes planning isn't enough, causing you to fall back on reflex and instinct. This is what makes the game as good as it is on higher difficulties, and the feeling of accomplishment is a breath of fresh air when everything goes right. Heading to Keys has him scolding you for doing exactly what he tried to prevent, but he's thankful regardless. Even more important though is the fact that he understands to a degree what Halo is, due to overhearing the Covenant talking about it. Just to clarify, I always assumed that the Covenant speaking human English was more for the benefit of the player's enjoyment. But you could argue that they know a small amount of English to better communicate with or interrogate humans. That said, the idea that the captain here overheard the Covenant talking about Halo is fucking hilarious. Like he's just sitting in his cell and an elite's like, Hey Eric, you know how uh, we're looking for a control room? What do you think about that? You think the control room will fire up this giant weapon called Halo so that we can obliterate humanity? Yeah, yeah you do. Hey Eric, Eric, you think that, don't you? We're just lucky this guy didn't get out of his cell and go, Halo. While I was in this cell, I heard the Covenant talking about something they, they call called Halo, Halo. 2. But you know what? Damn it! Why didn't we put that we in? We should have done that. What's wrong with you? <laughs> so yeah, Halo's thought to be a weapon that can destroy any life form if need be. And the Covenant are trying to locate its control room so that they can presumably kill off humanity with it. In order to get the jump on them and find it ourselves first, we need to head to another location on Halo known as the Silent Cartographer, a map room that will guide us to the control room. Getting off of the Covenant ship has Keys surprising us yet again, being able to manually pilot a Covenant aircraft somehow because he's just that good. Hell, maybe these guys weren't speaking English and he just understands their language. Might as well, right? When we arrive at the fourth level, we storm the beach and make our way to this map room. By now the formula of the game is pretty standard, having you drive to the main bit while encountering a few enemy encampments. When you get there, the Covenant lock you out from the map room, causing you to have to run back around the island to unlock it. You repeat the process of wiping out enemy forces until you work your way back to the building that houses the silent cartographer. At this stage, there's a lot more hunters which get pushed in at critical junctions. They aren't just sporadically placed around the map, every location seems intentional, which is probably the best way to implement them in my opinion. When you make it back to the cartographer, the level design yet again does wonders at making the game stellar. Halo has fantastic music. It's easily one of the reasons that it succeeds to the degree that it does. Thudding drum tracks, low humming instrumentals, orchestral pieces, guitar riffs, all of it combined to create a soundtrack that stuck with me for most of my life. But what many don't consider is that Halo's music does something equally as good. Silence. Much of the game is completely quiet as you fight through it. And you don't tend to notice that over the roar of gunfire or the treads of a warthog spinning. Because you're playing the game and focusing on those events as they arise. What the fourth level does specifically is places you in this dead quiet infrastructure. Enemies aren't yelling about or ready to attack. A few of them are quietly treading the floors, sure but a lot of them are sleeping or just casually standing around. And it becomes clear that the devs intended this to be another stealth sequence. You creep along the floors, knocking out enemies when you encounter them, all to complete silence. And to add to this phenomenon, an elite with a sword was shown in a cutscene walking through the door that you unlock to get here. You don't know where the fuck he is, and it adds to that tension immensely. These guys knew how to design a level, I mean there's no other way to put it. And when you do finally get to the schematics at the center of this blocky building, that's when the music kicks on full blast. The Covenant know you're here. The stealth is broken, it's time to fight. An iteration of the main theme rips through the TV as you rip through your enemies. It's just fucking brilliant. Oh yeah, the new weapon for this level is the rocket launcher. Guess what it does? That's right, it kills you when you panic switch to it and fire at the ground. Nah, I'm kidding. Remember that invisible elite with the sword? This is what it's for. Ha! See? After escaping with directions to the control room, the fifth level has us delving into the depths of Halo, helping us to solidify what exactly Halo is. It has beaches, water, forests, and so on. It has an atmosphere with breathable air. And underneath all of that is a network of underground structures that help it sustain everything. It's a massive entity created by some kind of life form and yet here we are diving into it to figure out how to control it and use it to destroy our enemies. All on a rumor more or less. 
Not a rumor, but just a fragment of information that makes up the full picture. Anyways, welcome to the fifth level. I'll bet you're wondering what praise I'll heap onto Halo this time around. The answer is not much, because I think this has to be the worst level in the entire game. It starts out fine. You head through some grayish looking structures and wind up out in a snowy chasm that seems to be deep within the depths of Halo. Cortana remarks that something might have gone awry with the weather system or perhaps it was done intentionally for reasons unknown. Then you continue on through another gray structure or two, grab a tank and have fun blowing up enemies with that for a bit. Maybe you even grab a Covenant ghost and glide around with that also. But then it just keeps going and going and going. You see, Halo had a pretty strict deadline with the Xbox launching and it needing to be on the front line so that people had something to play. I mean, there's only so long that you could play Fusion Frenzy for. This meant that there needed to be some pretty massive scaling back of the game, and it was initially meant to be an open world kind of endeavor. With that scaling came the discovery of the copy and paste shortcuts, and for some reason Bungie saw fit to paste these nondescript gray playgrounds with bridges back to back to back. Every time you think you're near the end, here comes another. There was even a point where I forgot how many times this shit repeats and was certain that when Cortana said, hey, this must be the control room, that that was the end of the level. It was not. Yeah, it's pretty rough overall. And you get to a point where you wanna stop fighting and just sprint through the rest of the level, which isn't a good sensation to have in your first person shooter. The thing is, the set pieces are actually pretty fun. There's the aforementioned scorpion tank zone, the wide open snowfields with banshees swooping in and wraiths gliding about. Even the ending rush is pretty fun in that you can go balls to the wall and just smash your way up the hill or grab the nearby sniper rifle and rocket launcher to pick off enemies one by one. But there's just way, way too much middle ground to slog through. It's too bad because this level in particular always stuck out to me, making me reconsider replaying the game when I'm trying to decide if I want to or not. After finally making it, we upload Cortana, who receives a wealth of information all at once. As she parses it, she begins to understand the magnitude of what Halo is, though it's not quite revealed yet. This was always a well done and fun way to tell a story, though I'll just go ahead and spoil it now instead of uh, hanging on to it. So Halo's a weapon, and it is one that is meant to eradicate any life that you would theoretically want it to. It was built by the Forerunners, one of the earliest and most advanced civilizations that basically shaped a lot of ongoing technology in the galaxy with their strides. The reason the various installations and iterations of Halo were built wasn't to just dominate, it was to survive, or at least to take down an enemy with the Forerunners. This enemy would be the Flood, one of the coolest and most chaotic factions I've seen in a game. The Flood are parasitic in nature and unprecedented in their ability to reproduce and grow taking over any nearby biomass in mere seconds. Additionally, the more that they infect, the smarter that they get, as their consciousnesses merge with their host and then transmit that data to a nearby grave mind, which is basically a mass of biology that has the capability of controlling all nearby flood. I mean, that's fucking cool. The spread of the flood pushed the Forerunners into a corner where the only way that they could win was by destroying all sentient life and thus Halo and the other installations of it were born. Here's the problem now. Well, uh, the other problem. Big Captain Keys has taken it upon himself to head to a nearby weapons cache in the hopes of getting a leg up on the Covenant. Turns out this weapons cache wasn't that at all, instead being a tomb of sorts for the Flood, which the Covenant had sealed away and was protecting. The lead up during this next mission is great. It has you landing on yet another biome on Halo, a dense jungle this time. Working your way to the tomb and then further within it has you encountering little resistance, the only real enemies being grunts and jackals which seem terrified. As you make it further in, carnage begins to line the halls, the remains of both Covenant and humans on display, red and blue blood streaking the walls. This again is one of those moments where you as the player realize how fragile you are as the chief, despite him being a badass. It doesn't feel like you're a killing machine, it feels like you're wandering further towards your own death. When you do make it to the center, the chief picks up a helmet with recorded footage on it. Watching it back shows the UNSC forces blissfully unaware as they make it to this point. They seem intent on getting to whatever the Covenant has locked down here, and Keyes shows up to lead the charge. Of course, it's not long before the flood begin pouring from the walls, overwhelming these guys pretty quickly. When I was a kid, I always referred to these little flood as popcorn, 
But seeing them now, I think the slithering tentacles which ooze from their mouth area kind of ruins that innocent idea of them for me. This is where the game completely shifts in how it's played, as you might imagine. Fighting isn't as much about finding cover and placing well-timed shots and grenades, it's about running and gunning the same way you might in a Doom game. The assault rifle becomes one of the best weapons at this point, as these little ones only take a single shot to kill. Thankfully, they don't inflict a ton of damage individually due to your armor, but they do make up for it in quantity. Once they find a body though, they take over, giving it new life as a quick-moving, high-jumping zombie of sorts. The radar goes from being generally pretty helpful to becoming a source of paranoia, as these things might be above you, below you, or right behind you. And all of it is accented by a track that's been floating around in my head since the first time I heard it. Level design-wise, you might think that this maze-like tomb would be annoying to traverse, and it definitely was when I first played, but it really isn't that bad. Covenant stragglers will actively fight against the flood, providing a distraction for you to slip by. Getting to the elevator has you breathing a sigh of relief because you know that the exit is just above you. However, John Halo can't read, and instead goes down the elevator, further into the tomb's depths. It's really well done, and depending on how you view it, you're either fighting for your life or you're here to eliminate as many of these things as possible. Your last new weapon in the game is the shotgun. This one's my third favorite, specifically because of how good it is at taking out the bigger flood. It's especially good when they charge you, but still pretty great when they stand back and shoot at you. Oh yeah, remember how they take control of their host's memories? Well, that means they know how to fire weapons also. I mean, come on. Great name, great enemy, great design. There's nothing to not love here. When you do eventually make your way out into the jungle again, it's fucking platoon out here. Soldiers running around getting lost, getting picked off by flood ambushes, gunfire everywhere. Eventually, you stumble upon the Forerunner AI that's in charge of Halo, which assists by dispatching these small drones called Sentinels to fry the flood with thick laser beams. The AI then introduces itself as 343 Guilty Spark and yoinks you through some kind of teleportation to a location known as the library. As I type this out, it becomes clear how confusing this whole plotline is without the supplementary information that I've learned throughout the years and many playthroughs of these games. I mean, without knowing anything besides what the game has shown you, you know that the Covenant sought out Halo as a weapon. You know that they found out about the Flood and protected the entrance of this tomb. Then suddenly this little floating eyeball goes, hey, I'm the keeper and stuff, come with me, we're gonna go do cool Halo shit. It's pretty back to back and some more nuance would have been nice, though again, time constraints. The library is a level I remember not liking as much, but upon replaying it, it's actually not that bad at all. The whole thing is a rush where you're following Spark around as it ushers you to the center of the library so that you can retrieve the index that will activate Halo. Only a human can snag it, so that's your purpose. As the Flood continues to assault you at all times, this stage even more so than the last is truly run and gun. You can actually slip by a lot of the Flood without fighting, but even playing for self-defense is going to have you running low on ammo occasionally, so mixing in some aggression is going to keep your weapons topped up as you maneuver between these large shifting doors and elevators. I think the biggest negative is again the samey looking structuring throughout, with repeating corridors and halls getting old after a bit. Still, it isn't that bad because you're running for your life a lot of the time. Hard to get upset about the same grayish walls if you're focused on the thousands of enemies. Throughout your journey, Spark provides more sentinels occasionally to help you succeed, which are very welcome in the moment. Unfortunately, that welcome wears off when it becomes clear that the chief was manipulated this whole time. I mean, kind of easy when all you have to do is say, hey, go do this, and he runs as fast as he can like he's about to drop a log in his pants. I know he's always been a cool guy, but most of his actions are him just following orders which makes him seem a little dumb at times. At least, in the first game. Regardless, Cortana pops in to intercept the Index as it's inserted into the console here. Somehow. Look, you can't even ask the devs on this one. They don't know how the Index was physical and then not either. Incident 1 of the magic disappearing Index in Halo 1. Because what is the Index made out of? No it's one really made out of. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same as the Cortana chip that just disappears into slots. Now, it was funny because I don't remember exactly why this was true, probably because in Halo 1... We have no idea how he took the index from Spark. We just, that's always off camera. Off camera. It happens off camera. 
So Cortana explains the whole, hey, this big ring system wipes out all sentient life in the galaxy so that the Flood don't have food thing. And Chief is like, what? No, I mean, this friendly bubble wouldn't lie, would it? Smark replies by more or less calling John a dipshit. This galaxy will be quite devoid of life, or at least any life with sufficient biomass to sustain the Flood. But you already knew that. I mean, how couldn't you? With Cortana obviously being against this plan, the Chief once again has an opinion and decides to go against Spark on this one. You would think that this would mean that you would have to fight the Flood and Sentinels on the way out. But the location that we teleported to is the same as the fifth level again. Which, um, yeah, not good. So it's back through the same kinds of hallways, bridges, and so on as you go to disable three different reactors in an attempt to destroy Halo. Basically, if we can disable them, Spark will have its hands full trying to repair the reactors while we locate the Pillar of Autumn and use its fusion core to destroy Halo permanently. Along the way, I run into this fun little bit where an elite has spawned in and snagged my Banshee. I need that to proceed to the next point. This is one of many fun soft locks that can occur in a level based on using Banshees to glide from point to point. This means that I can only restart the level from the beginning if I want to continue. How fun. I would say that this interaction combined with having to backtrack through the previously worst level in my opinion makes the eighth stage even worse than the fifth. I mean, there are redeeming qualities to it. The more open outdoor combat, the Covenant fighting the Flood, the Sentinels involving themselves in the mix, that's all really cool. But yeah, having to restart after clawing my way to this point is infuriating. The end of the level has Cortana locating Captain Keys and using a one-time teleport to get you close to where he is. This kicks off our penultimate stage, in which we recognize that Keyes is still alive on the Truth and Reconciliation and that the Covenant are doing everything to stop the Flood from leaving the planet by using one of their ships. This entire foray is a reimagining of the third level, complete with pits of greenish water or acid or whatever, lighting up the canyon that you crept along before to get to the Truth and Reconciliation. The Covenant are in a full-on war with the Flood now, and you can manage to slip by a battle or two if you're hasty enough. I always found it funny that no matter what harrowing battle that these guys are taking a part in, they'll nearly always go, oh fuck, it's that dude, and start sending a few rounds your way mid-battle. When you make it back aboard the ship, it's a complete mess. Parts are blown out and signs of battle scar nearly every surface. And the flood are seemingly endless. Like it gets to a point where you go, holy shit, I'm gonna run dry on ammo if I keep doing this. This makes gating checkpoints seemingly random, as sometimes you'll clear out or run through six areas back to back without a save. And sometimes you'll manage to hit that sweet spot and gain a checkpoint despite enemies still lurking about. Halo's checkpoint system is odd in that way, but you don't really feel that massive heap of relief hit you when you snag a checkpoint until the last levels. I'm okay with this being a rehash of a previous level just because of how fun and chaotic it is to watch the Covenant really try their best to beat an insurmountable enemy. True to their namesake, the Flood keep coming no matter what, and it makes for some really cool battles playing out throughout your sprint to Keys. Speaking of, the Captain is occasionally barking at you to turn back. Of course, he doesn't say, hey, I've been infected by the Flood and they've strung me up like a pinata. He just tells you to go away. Not that it would have mattered, we still need his data to figure out where the Autumn is. Getting to the Captain has us stumbling upon his now horrific looking body before we gingerly sink our fist into his skull and, um... Well, I, I guess we got some kind of chip out of his brain? I, I don't know. The future truly is unpredictable like that. The final escape sequence has the Covenant sending in their badass unit, which is comprised of elites and grunts clad in full black armor, which looks pretty slick to be honest. I mean, they kind of have a lot of grenades also, so they tend to explode very easily. But hey, they look the part, damn it. When we finally escape with a Banshee, we fly on over to the Autumn, where the final stage unfolds. Again, another twisted version of an old map, but I gotta respect Bungie's quick thinking with the timeline that they had. It winds up being a really fun full circle moment, as the Autumn is obviously completely fucked. And the best the Covenant has to offer is now fighting against the Flood, as are Spark's Sentinels. 
Like before, you can use these skirmishes to your advantage, pressing by big battles while minding your own business where applicable. There are moments where you cross back out into the same halls that you did before. Except instead of Humans vs. Covenant, it's Flood vs. Covenant. It's pretty neat in that regard. Heading to the main console has Cortana beginning a self-destruct countdown, only for Spark to show back up and prevent any further tampering via digital systems. Which means that we have to go the physical route. Chief pulls out a comically large grenade, setting our Plan B into motion officially. This next bit can be pretty easy or absolutely awful depending on a variety of factors. And when I say a variety of factors, I mean how good you happen to be at aiming grenades. Well, that and the luck of how many enemies swarm you while you're doing so. Basically, you're deactivating power couplings and lobbing grenades at vents to explode four different, um, I think they're reactors or engines, uh, something like that. It sounds easy until the devs decided to make the vents open and close, making it so that you have to time your throws pretty precisely. Fortunately, there's an armory nearby with plenty of rocket launchers and ammo, so you can try that out also. The issue is that you're gimping your overall power against the Countless Flood, seeing as the shotgun and AR combo is amazing against them. Still, it isn't as bad as I remembered it being. I've spent an hour or more on this mission in the past, but I believe I was also on Legendary then. Probably a big difference maker. When everything is nice and explodey, it's time to leg it out of here. The music is on point as always, and the final sequence has you escaping in a warthog as you slide past the remaining enemy forces. It feels more like a victory lap than a challenge, but I'm okay with that. After watching your pickup pelican get mauled by banshees, you have to find your own way out, grabbing a, um, I believe it's a long sword, but don't quote me on that. Unless I'm correct. Chief pilots the long sword out, and that's the end of Halo CE as the installation explodes in the background. Halo. It's finished. No, I think we're just getting started. Barring a few hiccups here and there, Halo Combat Evolved is exactly as good as I remember it being. It's very, very easy to see how the series took off the way that it did. It was like the developers knew the precise way to make their vision blossom to an impeccable degree. This was the type of passion that built the gaming industry. One that seems to have fallen to a secondary position when compared to profit and low-hanging fruit that a lot of developers go for today. And these guys knew that. They had plans in the works that show up in later entries, promising bigger and better moments in the future. Alright, before I move on to Halo 2, let's move over to my sponsor for this video, BetterHelp. If you're like me and, well, a lot of people out there, there might be areas in your life where you feel like you could genuinely use some improvement. Might be something as simple as trying to control your anger when your teammate decides to throw the game in the first five seconds. Or as complex as worrying about not spending enough time with your friends or family. Life is complicated, and while you tend to try to choose what's best for you in the moment, you'll often neglect things that might be more important to you than you think. For many problems like these, the idea of therapy has nearly always been floated around and often ridiculed for it being too simple of an answer. But there's a reason why it's still recommended to those trying to help manage their stress, anger, and so on. It works if you're willing to put in the work. With BetterHelp, you can take those first steps to becoming the person you want to be. And you can take them in a form that might be easier than having to head to a scheduled local location. BetterHelp can sift through your preferences, be it video chatting, a phone call, or even just messaging, and match you with one of over 30,000 therapists in their network to help you take those first steps in helping yourself. You'll fill out a questionnaire to get the specifics of what you want. BetterHelp will match you with a therapist within 48 hours in most cases, and then you can schedule your session at a time convenient for you. If for some reason you're not feeling like your therapist is a good match, you can easily switch to a new one in your settings at no additional cost. As with all medical services, BetterHelp isn't always going to be the answer for you specifically, and I personally wanted to make that clear here. But if you do feel like you could benefit from seeking therapy through BetterHelp, please feel free to click my link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash saltfactory for 10% off your first month. Thanks, guys. Okay, so I gotta clarify something for Halo 2 here. I'm definitely playing the remastered Anniversary Edition because, my god, these cinematics are fucking gorgeous. They were done by 343 Industries before they took over the series from Bungie. 
and they're literally the best thing that they've ever done with Halo. Remastering cutscenes and graphics were their calling, and someone mistook that for them being able to write cohesive plots and create compelling gameplay. This is a whole ass rant that I might bust into one day in a video about Halo 4 and beyond, but uh, all in due time. So Halo 2 kicks off with a cinematic that splits between the Covenant's point of view and the UNSC's. With the Covenant, we get introduced to the second main character of the game, the Arbiter. Well, he's not quite the Arbiter yet, but we'll get to that. For now, he's an elite who was the commander in charge of pursuing the Pillar of Autumn, and is now being reprimanded for allowing Halo's destruction. It's here where you start to get a taste of what the Covenant stands for, what they believe in. They view Halo and all other Forerunner technology as holy and sacred, their reverence for these artifacts and their creators pushing well into religious zeal. Likewise, we're introduced to the big bosses of the Covenant, old-looking, priest-like, chair-bound aliens known as the Prophets. Alongside them seem to be enforcers of sorts, big ape-like creatures referred to simply as brutes. As the Arbiter is denounced as a heretic by the Prophets for allowing Halo to be destroyed, he's bound by a few brutes, who strip his armor and brand him with a smoldering stake. These scenes are again fucking gorgeous. I know I said I wouldn't talk about graphics, but how can I not? 343 did a fantastic job breathing new life into these older cutscenes, and flipping between the two graphics in real time is always a treat. On the UNSC side of things, Master Chief is getting a new suit of armor taking away the health bar from the first game and replacing it with a faster charging shield. Along with Sergeant Johnson, who somehow made it off of Halo before it exploded, the two head to an award ceremony taking place at a station just on the outskirts of Earth. The apex of the scene has a small Covenant fleet stumbling into the region, and the station mobilizes to defend Earth with all they've got, kicking off the first level. So Halo 2 immediately feels like a more refined version of Combat Evolved. The movement feels better, the shooting feels snappier, even the enemies seem to have gotten more agile. This applies to the non-upgraded graphics as well, obviously. Things just feel smoother and less bulky in a pretty dramatic way. My favorite part has got to be the movement that enemies like elites perform as part of their combat routines. They were relatively agile before, but now they'll slide into cover, hurdle over objects, and duck and dip while firing at you. It's actually pretty impressive for a game that came out three years after its predecessor. For as many compliments as I paid the first game, Halo 2 makes it look more like Goldeneye after seeing what it brings to the table mechanically. Your new starting loadout for this game is the Battle Rifle and the SMG, both of which seem to be strict upgrades for your previous AR and pistol loadout, though not in the way that you might expect. The Battle Rifle can actually be likened to your pistol, which has a zoom that makes sense and fires in three round bursts. It's insanely powerful for one of the first weapons in the game, much like the pistol was in the first. The SMG, on the other hand, has that big, goofy circle reticle that the AR had in the first game, but can be dual-wielded to double the firepower if you so choose. I like dual-wielding for very specific instances where I'm sure that I can safely rush an enemy down, but a lot of the time it takes too long for me to reload for my liking to be a consistent option for me. Beyond these two, you'll see many of the same weapons that you've seen in the past pop up on the station as you navigate through it. Unfortunately, someone told the devs what a pistol is, and made it so that you can't aim down its non-existent scope in this one. It does shoot a lot quicker though and is really accurate, so it's not bad overall. I actually never used it when I was younger due to a lack of zoom, but trying it out now had me pleasantly surprised. Eventually, you'll make it out into the vacuum of space where things are quieter. I wonder if Bungie made an executive decision to give weapons some kind of sound out here, because they actually made it so that Halo's explosion in the first game was soundless since it was in space. I mean, it'd probably be a bit jarring for there to be no sound, but it might be kind of fun also, honestly. Regardless, elites now have the option of using jetpacks, which make for some fun encounters later. What aren't as fun are your first new enemy, the drone. I hate drones. They're very quick, sporadically moving, flying enemies that tend to attack in swarms, forcing you to find cover or be overwhelmed. Don't get me wrong, they're a cool idea, but shit, man. I've died to a lot of bugs in my time. So this whole mission culminates in what seems to be an almost guerrilla tactic from the Covenant. The initial shock and awe had one of their ships taking advantage of the chaos and beelining it to Earth's surface. 
Meanwhile, a different group planted a massive bomb aboard the station, ensuring that we focus on that first and buying the initial ship some time. And of course, many of their forces boarded the station to make sure that the bomb actually goes off. The best part about having religious zealots at your disposal is that you can order them to do crazy shit like guard a nuke until it explodes. Making it to the bomb leads to potentially one of the best introductory sequences to a game. Just one question. What if you miss? I won't. Side, gear up. I mean, even today, that shit is really damn cool. Actually, with the graphical improvements, I'd say especially today. The start of the second mission has us figuring out that one of the prophets is here on Earth, looking for something. The message just repeats. Regret, regret, regret. Catchy. Any idea what it means? Dear humanity, we regret being alien bastards. We regret coming to Earth. And we most definitely regret the core just blew up our raggedy ass fleet. Hoorah! Regret is a name, Sergeant. The name of one of the Covenant's religious leaders, a prophet. This leads us into a less familiar setting for a Halo game, fighting through the streets of New Mombasa, Kenya. Like I said, the Covenant's tactics seem to be more impromptu, especially now that they're on Earth. Small forces try to lock down blocks of buildings. Corridors are guarded by sniper units that are reinforced by drones and elites utilizing active camo. The devs did a good job at making the Covenant units feel like they're scrambling and attempting to secure regions at all times. New to the enemy roster are freshly equipped jackals, which have ditched their shields in favor for a new type of Covenant sniper rifle called the Beam Rifle. It's absolutely lethal on legendary difficulty making encountering a nest of jackals a death sentence a lot of the time. On Heroic, it'll knock your shields out completely and kill you if they're down. The main difference between a beam rifle and a human sniper rifle is that it has no magazine to change, but will overheat after two to three successive shots, depending on how quickly you're firing. Energy swords also make a return, which you'll see a lot more of in this game. The difference is that you can actually use them this time around, with their lunging capabilities making them one of the most lethal weapons in the game. They're fantastic for when you're in tight spaces, but you'll often just die if you're running around in the open with one. After fighting through a good chunk of the city outskirts, you make your way to some odd highway tunnels. I mean, it's the future and all that, but I can't imagine how traffic works when there are whole ass walls which I assume can be locked down and closed off. Human architecture, halo level design, I guess. It's during this driving sequence that Cortana taps into the Covenant's comms, figuring out that they seem to be surprised that Earth was even here. It explains why they invaded with such a small force, and why everything seems so off the cuff for them from the start. This driving sequence is fun, but pretty tough, forcing you to exercise patience before punching through the enemy lines. I mean, you gave me a stretch of road and access to the fastest vehicle in the game. I want to go fast. But yeah, if you don't at least thin the herd a bit before trying to wedge through a gap, you're probably going to die. The goal of the next level is trying to take down the Scarab that the Prophet of Regret seems to be commanding from his ship above it. The Scarab is fun because it wasn't created with the purpose of being a massive combat tank. It was meant for excavating, particularly for digging up Forerunner artifacts. That said, when you have a massive laser cannon on this thing, you might as well use it for fighting too, if need be. Still, the fact that it was deployed here means that there is some kind of artifact up for grabs on Earth, which is likely why the Prophet found the planet in the first place. Anyways, here comes Sergeant Johnson to lead the charge against the Scarab. He's one of those characters that you either love or hate, and I haven't met a single person who's hated him. Where's the rest of your platoon? Wasted, Sarge. And we will be too, sir, if we don't get the hell out of here. You hit Marine. N no, sir. Then listen up. When I joined the Corps, we didn't have any fancy schmancy tanks. We had sticks, 
two sticks and a rock for a whole platoon. And we had to share the rock. Thanks for the tank. He never gets me anything. Oh, I know what the ladies like. Dude seems like the type of guy to carry around a wallet that says bad motherfucker. So the start of this stage is a little... and eh, not my favorite. It's centered around vehicular combat, which has never really been my preference. But it does make sense given the circumstances. I guess controlling the scorpion tank has always been a little bulky and simple, you know? Push slowly along the road, shoot cannons at other vehicles. Further in, you get access to a warthog, but you can't really take it anywhere. I will say that the NPC soldiers in this game are much more competent than they were in the previous game, and will actually do quite a bit of work on random grunts and elites. I like that. Because it's not like you'll always have them with you, so you might as well get a bit of protective escort for part of the level. I had one guy go hog wild after he made it out of the tunnels. Dude was a beast. From here you can grab a ghost, which is easily my favorite vehicle because of how snappy and quick it is to pilot. I always feel like I'm on even ground with other vehicles if I have an intact ghost, just because I can escape if I need to for a moment. The climax of this stage is easily the best part, and has you jumping down on the scarab and taking it out from the inside, resulting in a cool-ass cinematic as the main theme crescendos. The Prophet of Regret decides to cut his losses from here, opening a slipspace jump in the middle of the city and attempting to haul ass. Captain Keyes' daughter Miranda decides to pursue with the chief in tow, and the scene fades out after considerable damage is done to New Mombasa in the wake of the jump. This is where the game takes a turn, as the fourth mission has us now following what happens with the Covenant. As the punished elite is dragged before the High Prophets in private, the Prophets offer him a choice. They briefly explain to the elite that Arbiters have always stood up for the Covenant and held it together in times of crisis. They list a few examples, like the taming of the Hunters, or the crushing of something called the Grunt Rebellion. Were it not for the Arbiters, the Covenant would have broken long ago! Even on my knees, I do not belong in their presence. Halo's destruction was your era, and you rightly bear the blame. But the Council was overzealous. We know you are no heretic. This time, the Hierarchs have decided that an Arbiter is needed to stop a group of heretics who are threatening to tear the Covenant apart by convincing a chunk of its followers that the Prophets are wrong. Our elite friend immediately accepts the job, the idea that he can restore his honor driving him. What would you have your Arbiter do? Back when this game came out, I can't stress how shocking it was that you could now play as an Elite. I mean, they were the bad guys. Master Chief is on the front of every cover. That's who you play as, right? Bungie did this really, really well. Because yes, of course, you could just have the whole thing revolve around the Chief's exploits again, and that would be fine. But why not give things a bit more depth? Why not show off how the Covenant is structured, how they think, who they are? You could easily get away with having the whole game be about the faceless Master Chief taking on a strange alien threat who only want to kill humanity. Mix in the flood and there we are, ship it. It would still be a good game. But what if you lent the audience a little perspective on one of these main factions? Now you've got something really good. And it was too much of this exact line of thinking that I think ruined a lot of the story and ideas that changed Halo later on when Bungie took their leave. But again, that's a topic for another time. So the Arbiter is now aboard a Special Ops Covenant ship, flying to where these heretics seem to be holed up and using Forerunner technology to broadcast their message. The attitude of the Arbiter seems to be despondent, still ashamed of his failures. He concedes wholeheartedly to the Elite Commander, who tells him that he doesn't give a shit about the Arbiter's life, only the life of his men. It's really fun to see the Covenant act, well, human, in scenes like these. Because let's face it, they were strange invading monsters before this game. They had personality, sure, but personality in combat is much different than personality outside of it. Seeing the Arbiter grapple with his feelings of inadequacy combined with his eagerness to make up for his failure, I, I don't know, it just opens your eyes to a new side of what used to only be a group of lizards and bugs. These are my elites. Their lives matter to me, yours does not. That makes two of us. So the Arbiter is built for the Energy Sword solely because he can activate camouflage repeatedly. There's a bit of a cooldown, but it isn't a lengthy one by any means. 
This means that you can easily zip in, take out some elites, and bug out if need be. It really helps the mission to feel like a spec ops task that you're a pivotal part of, much more than the sniper mission in the first game. Your new weapons here include the Covenant Carbine and the Sentinel Beam, the latter of which comes from the active Sentinels here at the facility. This shocks the Spec Ops commander who doesn't understand why they would side against the Prophets. I mean, the High Prophets teach the Covenant to worship the Forerunners and all their technology, right? So why would they side with the Heretics here? Regardless, the beam is… Eh, well, not good. It's a very low damage beam, with the upside being that it can fire in a continuous stream. So good for something like… oh, um, I don't know, the Flood? The Carbine, on the other hand, is one of my favorite weapons in the game, and is the first Covenant weapon to use a magazine of any sort. I guess, unless you count the Needler. It's probably as close to the battle rifle as you can get on the Covenant side of things, making it my go-to for a lot of these missions. This is the level that showcases just how many more strides Halo 2 made over its predecessor, in my opinion. The active camo is a great touch, really fleshing out those stealth moments that you saw prior into a fully realized level instead of sporadic spurts of sleeping grunts. The moving energy treads indicative of the mining facility that the heretics hold up in add a flair to level traversal. Spec Ops units moving in and engaging on your go make you feel like you're with a unit of highly trained specialists rather than a ragtag group of marines that yell about whatever the fuck they're doing from moment to moment. And to cap it all off, the final bit has you taking a banshee for a spin, really hammering home the idea that every vehicle has been reworked to be less unwieldy. You can kick on the jets and move quickly when you need it, your main guns fire much quicker, and you can perform evasive rolls and flips to avoid incoming fire. It's a really well done vehicle section that feels rewarding to play, unlike the scorpion section prior. Plus, the whole thing is accentuated by… well, there's a crazy ass song by Incubus in the original version of the game. It's funny because the devs wanted to license out a song by the Rolling Stones and Halo 1 while the soldiers are heading to the Flood Tomb. That didn't pan out, but later on they wound up having Incubus and Breaking Benjamin add some tracks to their game. As you can imagine, music licensing doesn't do so well over time, and so this track was replaced with a different song in the remaster. It's all down to preference, but I find the redone version to be better for this bit. The original song came out of nowhere and didn't really fit the motif of the game at all. This one's still a bit out there, but it works. The next level begins with an immediate threat of Flood, which seemed to have overwhelmed quite a large chunk of heretic forces. I initially thought that my loadout was ill-equipped for Flood, but I actually learned something here that I never realized. Attacking Flood takes much less of your sword energy away than attacking Covenant soldiers does, which is a really nice touch. Where one swing might deplete 10% of your energy on an Elite or a Grunt, a single swing will only take away 3% on a standard non-popcorn Flood, and it doesn't take any energy to slice the small ones. Kind of makes sense, I imagine it's a lot easier to cut through the armorless, fleshy body of a Flood as opposed to the tougher hide and armor of an Elite. Later on, when Flood do wind up having armor, it takes a lot more energy to cut them down. It leads to some really fun back and forth, where you're keeping an eye on your radar for any blips and flinging yourself around between enemies. If you aren't careful, the larger Flood forms will knock you out fast, adding danger to your sword dance. When you make it back outside, you're given reinforcements for the final push towards the heretic leader, again reinforcing your role as a unit rather than a one-man army. Of course, that unit feeling doesn't last long when the heretic leader holds himself up in one of the rooms on the mining facility. The Arbiter, feeling like this is his time to shine, has everyone else fall back while he cuts the cables to the facility, causing it to begin a free fall from its previously suspended location above the surface of whatever planet this is. The shift from being precariously above this gassy, hazy hellscape to plummeting through it is fucking awesome and a bit scary, the Arbiter now having to navigate back through this whole facility while chasing the heretic leader. When we finally catch up to him, a standoff occurs where the heretic reveals Spark to the Arbiter, claiming that the Prophets have been lying to the Covenant. This might require a brief explanation that could be much more detailed, but I'll give it my best. So the average Covenant, um, citizen? would view 343 Guilty Spark as the Oracle, revering it as a holy keeper of Forerunner secrets and knowledge. This is part of what they're taught by the High Prophets, more or less. So when Spark starts sputtering about how Covenant beliefs are fucking silly, it tends to resonate with them, causing them to question what the Prophets teach. That's what happened with the heretic leader here. 
But before the Arbiter can get any real answers, the heretic leader opens fire, leading to a boss fight. This is very clearly the devs wanting to hold on to some sort of mystery until later, as it's clear that the Arbiter was receptive to listening to what Spark had to say. You would think that the heretic would gamble on the idea that he could find an ally in the clearly capable Arbiter, but he instead tries to kill him right there. It just seems more than a little stupid to not take that chance when the heretic has his back against the wall. The fight itself is quick and easy with the energy sword, only accentuating this outcome's shortcomings as one of the few less than stellar pieces of Bungie's storytelling. Before the Arbiter can quiz Spark again, one of the brutes named Tartarus, who we've seen a few times as an enforcer for the Prophets, rips the small orb away, chucking it aboard the ship. This shocks the Arbiter, who's clearly confused by the seemingly rough treatment of something so sacred to the Covenant. And that's where the scene sets on the Covenant side of things for now. Of course, you just raised a bunch of intrigue with the scenes prior, so you gotta pull your audience back to being interested in the UNSC side of things. Sorry for the quick jump, Sergeant. You in one piece? I'm good. Yeah. Chief? We're fine. Chief, take first platoon. Hard drop. Secure our landing zone. Sergeant, load up two flights of pelicans and follow them in. Aye, aye, ma'am. Until I can move and fight, I'm going to keep a low profile. Once you leave the ship, you're on your own. Understood. Okay, I'm interested again. So Big Chief and company find out pretty quickly that the Prophet of Regret's jump has led to another installation of Halo, called Delta Halo. Which does feel stupid. I mean, there's never been a part of these games where it hasn't been implied that there's more than one Halo ring. But I don't know. It just feels like, oh, now there's more Agent Smiths and we gotta kill those too. You can explain it all you want, but I think the reality is that it'd be cooler if there were more of them in the sequels. The next stage is very structured in a way where you can see how the devs were thinking. In this case, they give you a rocket launcher to take out some turrets, then they give you a warthog to secure the next area with, then they give you a scorpion to take out countless vehicles, and then they give you as many snipers as you can carry for a full-on sniping section. This is how you design a first-person shooter level. Set piece to set piece, bit of excitement to bit of excitement. You get to play how you want to still, but following how Bungie set it up makes for quite a bit of fun level design as you work your way towards where Regret is. The opening scene for the next level has the Prophet of Regret broadcasting to the Covenant here, claiming that he intends to activate this installation of Halo in order to purge their enemies and begin what they call the Great Journey. This is the belief that activating all the Halo rings will create a sweeping wind of change and elevate the Covenant and all who are worthy to Godhood. It's very biblical in that regard, and it's clear where the writers took motivation from. That said, this is almost exactly the same plot as the last time, which is again kind of why it feels lazy rather than inspired, despite the first game telling you that a lot of these rings exist with the same construction and purpose. Miranda claims that she'll head to grab the Index this time, while you work towards killing Regret, so at least there's a slight difference in objective. Fighting to the area where Regret is supposed to be has the snarkiest damn marine I've ever seen tagging along. Never liked it. Mad he's gone. Thank you for doing your job, marine. Now go away. This guy is so damn uppity that I lost focus when he complimented me. Bang! That's some good shooting, chief. Anyways, this next bit has us taking a slow-moving gondola across a gap while enemies assault us. Miranda claims that she can't help because she wants to keep a low profile, so the best that she can do is send a pelican our way to drop off ammo, weapons, and a few marines. Well, they were nice enough to bring us a ride. Yes, because that pelican earlier was for dropping off only, not picking up and flying us directly to the fucking objective. Hey, there it is. So this whole level is basically gondola ride, underwater plunge, underwater plunge, gondola ride. It again feels silly just because we probably could have rode straight to the last gondola drop off. I mean, under heavy fire, sure. But hey, it's not like we have anything to rush over, like the end of humanity looming due to a giant death beam or anything like that, right? Where the last level was really well done, this one is lacking in nearly every way, with the main objective being compelling, but the lead up being, uh, well, slow rides. Killing Regret is a lot harder than the Heretic Leader, at least, as the guy is constantly bringing in new Honor Guard to protect him. 
Honor Guard are badass elites assigned directly to the protection of the High Prophets, and they usually come bearing swords or plasma rifles. It doesn't help that the Prophet's chair has battle capabilities as well, firing a long-range beam across the room while you scramble. To kill him, you have to get up close and punch his ass to death, which was definitely a stylistic choice above all else. Each time you hit him in the remastered version, a guitar wails, which I always found especially jarring. Again, a stylistic choice. Whoa! Whoa! After punching Regret's lights out, it seems the bulk of the Covenant fleet has arrived on scene under its capital ship and city, a space station known as High Charity. This thing is effectively the Covenant's homeworld, and the fact that it's a mobile craft with billions of citizens aboard it is a fucking cool-ass touch. When Regret dies, High Charity attempts to kill off Master Chief once and for all, causing him to leap into the water here. As the chief sinks into its depths, a tentacle seems to wriggle from the bottom, dragging him down and telling him that it's not his time yet. Again, we cut back to the Arbiter, who walks with the Brutes to meet with the remaining High Prophets. Due to the Elite's perceived shortcomings when protecting their leaders, the Prophets had decided to swap out the Honor Guard for Brutes, who they deemed to be the more effective warriors. This has caused the elites to threaten to leave the Covenant, the whispers of a civil war beginning to bubble beneath the surface of this hour of crisis. Of course, the Arbiter has to be as much of a yes-man as the Chief, though his religious zeal definitely helps to set his motivations on a different level. So he blindly continues to follow orders, his next task being to retrieve the Index from the library on this installation. God damn it, it is the same story. I mean, props to Bungie for mixing it up while fleshing out the other side, but I don't know about hitting the same story beats. Infiltrating the library is at least much different than the previous one. There's a lot more Forerunner activity, with little repair drones flitting from chunk to chunk of the building, trying to patch up the damage done to it. They show up on your radar, making it hard to detect actual enemy presence, again showing how Bungie is willing to play with something so basic to the game. Although that doesn't actually last too long, as these are the only ones that you'll wind up seeing throughout your run through the area. As you plummet through the series of tubes to the center, you'll run into broken up groups of Covenant who initially tried and failed to get to the center of the library. This is a great addition, because while you could just slip by the Sentinels that are focused on the grunts and jackals here, a sense of unity washes over you, compelling you to help these little guys to safety after their units were torn apart. I always wish that the Arbiter would exchange a few words with them. I feel like it would have helped to lend this whole endeavor a little more depth. Eventually, you make it to a part of the library where, surprise, more Flood are lurking. This is probably one of the tougher Flood sections as the bigger forms are much more agile in this game and are liable to kill you in one or two hits. Oh, and they also scream and moan like zombies now. With the lack of music, it makes for some pretty tense moments throughout this leg of the journey, even with invisibility. Ironically, I wound up using the equivalent of the same shotgun assault rifle loadout that I used in the first game thanks to the human marines who found themselves here after Miranda Keys rushed off for the Index. The end part of this stage has you tumbling through more tunnels and into the outside, which is an incredible moment. It doesn't matter if the outside world is a desolate haze of green and purple, it's the outside. And it's gotta be better than being trapped inside that minotaur maze of the dying. You're soon joined by the Spec Ops Commander and a few Elites, and you stand against a few waves of Flood while waiting for reinforcements to arrive. A scene plays out where the Arbiter explains that the Index is here, and the Elites rally for one last push into the center of the library. The next level starts out with a vehicle section, though this one is much more erratic. Flood have taken to piloting every vehicle that you can think of, and they seem to be fucking good at it. Well, good as in they're willing to completely disregard their own safety to focus solely on offense, which makes them quite a lot harder to survive. The camaraderie on display between these elites again helps you to feel at home in the role of a religious alien trying to activate a death laser. And having reinforcements swoop in to help you against these seemingly much more intelligent flood is a godsend. When you make it to the final push, you again wonder why you didn't just take the fucking big-ass Covenant ship straight to this point. Halo 1 didn't have this problem because you didn't always know where everything was supposed to be, and even if you did, you were usually on your own. You could argue that the Covenant didn't know which part of the library that this thing was at either, but you would think that with the help of Spark, they'd know precisely where the Index is. I don't know, I'd think even like a, 
Oh, the door is locked unless you get a passcode from the start of the library. Would have done wonders to make this not feel stupid. But either way. It's clear at this stage that the elites despise the brutes for forcing them out of their positions. And Tartarus only continues to gloat in his phantom ship as the Arbiter and his elites do all the work. The next few scenes have a lot to take in, as much more of the story falls into place. First, we see Keys out here attempting to snag the Index before being saved by Johnson as she almost falls to her death. Man, these Keys really don't believe in hanging back and just commanding, do they? At this point, the Arbiter rushes in, knocks out Johnson, and attempts to wrestle the Index from Keys before Tartarus steps in and knocks her out as well. When the Arbiter insists that the Index is his responsibility, the Brute laughs in his face before explaining that the Prophets told him to kill off the Elites here and deliver the Index to them. And the Prophets learn of this, that they will take your head when they learn. <laughs> Fool, they ordered me to do it. If there was anything that the original Halo series did best, it was back-to-back -back flashy cinematics and amazing one-liners. It was the glue that held each level together, even if it just seemed like the cool thing to do in the moment. Well, the Arbiter also gets snagged by the tentacle, and is brought to where the Chief is strung up. This is where the third party is truly revealed as more than just mindless zombies, as we finally meet a grave mind. After identifying both the Chief and the Arbiter's state of mind, it realizes how useful the two would be in preventing Halo from firing. It tries to convey to the Arbiter in particular that the so-called Great Journey is a sham, even bringing up the Prophet of Regret from a sea of bodies to Babel for a bit. The Arbiter doesn't seem to buy it, but the Grave Mind accepts him as useful anyways placing both him and the Chief in separate locations where the Index may likely have been taken. You know, when it's hard to get from leave. one place in the Halo universe to another, Just you know teleport. what you do? They teleport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, fine. How can I rag on something when the devs are sitting here going, yeah, I don't know, he teleported them, I guess. So this level is fucking tough, at least for a bit. If there's something I realized throughout these games, it's that getting caught with weapons that you don't really like sucks to have to deal with. On top of that, you're now primarily fighting brutes instead of elites, which immediately show off just how battle-savvy they are. So you know how elites tend to lose their shit and start charging you aggressively after they get their shields popped? Well, brutes kind of do the same thing, but they'll just up and decide to charge on all fours with any amount of health, which will kill you in two or three hits. From full health, these things take a lot of body shots, and I've never been good at hitting their heads with how much they bob and weave. It makes for a whole new challenge playing the game, because by this stage I've gotten pretty used to elite movement. How they duck and zip from side to side where their head will generally be, but I never got used to brutes in the same way, and it makes them the tougher enemy for me personally. You can obtain the final new weapon in the brute shot, which is a grenade launcher that I've never found to be particularly helpful. Well, at least in this game, I found it much more helpful in the next one. I mean, sure, it's great at clearing out clumps of smaller enemies, but Brutes will take about three head-on shots before going down. And with four grenades in the magazine, it makes this thing relatively useless against more than one Brute. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, you were teleported to High Charity. This place is fucking nuts to look at, and your entire objective is tracking and killing the Prophet of Truth, who has made his way further into this Sea of Lights. As you head along, the devs thought, shit, what else could we have Chief do? And came up with the idea of him freeing Marines from their prisons. Which, yeah, fine objective. But they die pretty quickly at this stage in the game. And I wound up having one guy make it from the prison pen area, making this whole thing seem kind of silly. Throughout the Halls of High Charity, full-on civil war has finally erupted between the Elites and the rest of the Covenant, making some of these areas filled with conflict that you can utilize to slip by unscathed, or you can jump in and attack both sides. It's pretty fun to see this overarching story play out while you move through the levels, with one of the Prophets broadcasting to High Charity citizens about the Elites no longer being deemed as part of the Covenant. Makes you wonder what's going on with the average citizens down below during all of this. After clawing your way to the end of this level, a final battle takes place between the Brutes and the Elites, with a few Hunters mixed in for shits and giggles. Cortana advises you to let the battle run its course, but that shit's nigh on impossible because hiding seems to get me nowhere. In the old version, Breaking Benjamin is playing here, which was always fucking strange, much like Incubus earlier. Even the new music is... 
I mean, I get why, but it's still really jarring. After dying a dozen times, I finally succeed in escaping from this hell of a level. It's really not the best designed level as again the devs decided to copy and paste quite a lot of its layout to extend it out. I will say that they at least try to make things interesting with the whole ousting of elites event, but it's really difficult to overlook the level design when you head through the same kinds of hallways, the same kinds of inner chambers, the same kinds of light elevators, and the same kinds of outdoor open fighting areas. And the difficulty spike only makes things more aggravating as you try your best to hustle through the area. The end of the level has Miranda's ship crashing into the innermost chambers of High Charity, and a swarm of flood being released from its bowels. As Tartarus and his crew begin staving off the popcorn, one gets by and jumps on the Prophet of Mercy, beginning to strangle him. Oddly enough, the Prophet of Truth decides to allow him to die, his excuse being that they have shit to do that's more important than him. I guess it's just a power grab, but I don't know. It almost seems like it's there for shock value or just to show how bad he is. The great journey waits for no one, brother. Not even you. Got a solid one-liner in there, at least. The next level has us following the Arbiter's side of things, who was seemingly teleported to some part of Halo instead of High Charity. And honestly, this portal makes sense despite it not being near the Index. Because while the guy was betrayed by Tartarus, he still seems to cling to his religion, almost in denial about what had happened. Seeing the trail of his fallen brothers with brutes gloating over their bodies is a pretty strong wake-up call. And again, this mission evokes that sense of brotherhood and causes you to feel like a guerrilla fighter trying to gain a foothold on the brutes stationed here. The grunts seem to have sided with the elites, while the jackals went with the brutes, which I thought was kind of fun. It's a short level, but the action is good and there's no repetition like the last stage. Heading back to the chief's side of things has him coming up on Mercy, who's still struggling with that one popcorn. He claims that Truth is heading to Earth to wipe it out, but you would think that just having the threat of Halo activating would be enough to try to stop him anyways. But sure, he's going to Earth also. Then Cortana comes up with a plan where you're not gonna believe this shit. She's gonna blow up the reactors of Keys' ship and destroy Halo. And, and high charity, I guess. It's not a very original plan, but we know it'll work. This level is even shorter than the last one, almost a half level with how quick it is. I mean, I guess I spent a lot of the stage just running by everything, but something about the flood fighting the brutes makes me nope right the fuck out of fighting if I can. Plus the chambers here again repeat as far as infrastructure goes, so it's not like I'm missing out on much. The only new bit of info that we get here is Cortana telling us that Gravemind used us as a distraction while it slipped the flood-infected ship into the city so that it could feast upon the billions of Covenant. Which, yeah, I don't think that we had much of a choice. Plus, this whole route is still beneficial for us in terms of survival. But we're starting to face the same issue that the Forerunners ran into. How do you stop something this aggressive and adaptive? Eh, that's a problem for future humanity. The final stage of the game has us starting at the Arbiter's angle again. After meeting with the nameless Spec Op commanders for one last attack, the duo descend on the building where the Prophets are supposed to be consecrating the Index, whatever that entails. Which means that the Arbiter was placed just far enough away from it to learn the truth, but close enough to make a difference in terms of recovering the Index. Very convenient. This one starts out as a big-ass vehicle section, but then gets a bit more special when it turns out that the Hunters have been convinced to join our side. Hell yeah, they have. I mean, nothing feels better as an ally than a fucking Hunter. And this next section has them just thudding away at the Brutes, which line up and get a face full of thick green laser. Eventually, the sheer numbers of Brutes with grenade launchers will take them down, but man, it's fun up until that point. The plan now is to use a scarab to blow away the doors of the temple where everything is about to go down. Fortunately for us, Sergeant Johnson is already on the case and offers a brief alliance in order to take down the bigger threat. Another vehicle section ensues, though this one is a lot tougher. A banshee can only stand up to so much firepower, making evading in and out of battle key to getting to the doors in one piece. So here we are. Tartarus is now trying to force Keys to push the Index into the console that will activate Halo, which isn't really explained in great depth, only implied that for some reason humans have to be the ones to take and use the Index. 
There's a line in Halo 1 that's very easy to miss, where Spark says that it's excited to learn about our history when it begins sifting through the Pillar of Autumn's archives. And again, none of this is really expanded on or noticed by anyone else at this stage. But it's clear that there was a direction that the writers were taking with all of this Forerunner stuff. Either way, Johnson and the Arbiter initiate a standoff between Tartarus and his brutes, with the Arbiter trying to convey that the Prophets have betrayed everyone. But Tartarus doesn't buy it, even when Spark reveals the true purpose of Halo to him, which I always thought was done really well. Tartarus has always been one of the most fanatical people in these games. He doesn't care for the actual Forerunner tech, and constantly berates Spark while showing a lack of care about it throughout the game. What he actually cares about is the word of the Prophets and becoming their number one species within the Covenant. So rather than taking the time to think on Spark and the Arbiter's words here, Tartarus flips his shit and forces Keys to shove the Index into the console. As Halo begins to spin up, a boss fight ensues as the final showdown begins. This fight fucking sucks. I mean, thematically and from a choreography perspective, it's good. But the actual mechanics involve, well... Tartarus has a crazy strong shield, which works in the moment because every brute that you've encountered doesn't use shields. They instead have a large health pool. And that was great because it makes fighting them fundamentally different from fighting elites. With elites, you can't just throw out some shots and wait, because they'll just come back at full strength in a moment. With brutes, you can get off a few shots and focus on others if they take cover, and then finish them off when you get the chance. Tartarus, on the other hand, requires constant fire to break his shield and then takes, like, I think five sword slashes on Heroic to take him out. Again, the use of stealth and all that is great for this battle, and that's how it was designed. Johnson and the other elites will fire at the brute while you lurk around and wait for the shield to break. But the amount of time that you get to inflict damage is around three seconds max. This causes you to want to charge Tartarus whenever you see him become vulnerable and doing that is a goddamn death sentence most of the time. There doesn't seem to be a rhyme or reason to when this brute reacts to you swinging on him. Sometimes you can get a shot in and flee. Other times he'll spin around on you in an instant and smash you with his hammer. This is always a one-shot kill, at least on Heroic. And it makes the fight that much more frustrating because sometimes you'll just die and there's nothing you could do about it. I again like the setting and the ideas at play, but it doesn't necessarily feel fair. Regardless, once the big brute goes down, that's the end of the game. Keys is able to rip the Index out of the console and stop Halo from firing, but it still sends out a signal to the other installations, causing them to set up for a remote firing sequence. When asked where this remote firing sequence can be activated, Spark replies with a simple answer, the Ark. Again, a play on the whole Noah's Ark and Great Flood story from the Bible, but a fun one nonetheless. Panning back to the Master Chief has him riding in on the Forerunner ship that was launched from High Charity to Earth, bringing us this great moment that inspired the marketing for Halo 3. Master Chief, you mind telling me what you're doing on that ship? Sir, finishing this fight. I think that replaying Halo 2 has caused me to be able to place my finger on something that I've never quite fully understood until now because I've always loved the story, but part of me always disregarded its narrative when put next to 1 and 3. And after playing through the whole thing, I've come to realize that I love Halo 2's characters and world building, its cinematic moments and lore concepts. But so much of it is, well, the story beats are recycled to a degree. It has these incredible moments where the Chief jumps off a space station with a Covenant bomb, or the Arbiter receives his armor and mantle or the Gravemind reveals itself as this ungodly abomination of flesh and intelligence. And those moments stick with you. It's easy to see why 343 was so interested in putting so much effort into this game's cinematics in particular. It starts out so unique and separate from the first game's plot. And then it converges on the same type of story after the Prophet of Regret flees to Delta Halo. Big Ring, Flood Unleashed, Recover the Index, Index is taken by the bad guys, stop them before it's too late. It has some twists, but not enough to make it fundamentally stand out as a strong narrative. Combined with the repeating level design, and it's clear that there was a lot of cut content towards the end of development that made things more rushed than you would hope for them to be. But I think the most egregious thing that Halo 2 does by itself narratively is conclude on such an unsatisfying cliffhanger. It's not like the good guys celebrate their victory and then in the post-credits something is revealed that foreshadows the next game. 
They literally stop Halo from firing, which creates a bigger problem while the Covenant begin invading Earth. Yes, it sets up Halo 3 beautifully, but it doesn't make playing through Halo 2 and then having to wait three years any more satisfying. With Halo 1, there was the promise of more, but you felt like you won in the moment. As always, time constraints seem to be the issue here, which is so unfortunate. Hey! What is that? Where is it? <gasps> da, 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 da. It's obviously on the last level of the game. Woohoo! I can hardly wait to play this last level. Let's do it. Damn yes, you. What? Wait. <laughs> well, this obviously is the music that's leading us into the last level, right? Marty, you seem to still harbor a lot of <laughs> bad feelings about this. Yeah, there was supposed to be a whole uh, there was supposed to be a whole mission there, Joe. Uh, actually, I think there were supposed to be three missions. Well, there was one important one. <laughs> that's right. But what was going to happen? Well, wait, wait a minute. Arrive but, back at Earth. But we, we don't want to say what was going to happen because we're not. We, it never did happen, and that's not part of what Halo Three. Is. I think. Yeah, the whole extra mission there would have uh, ended that uh, ended that game with a bang. Mm -hmm. But that was what we had. That was what we had to do. We did everything we could in the time we had. But the worst thing that affected how I personally remembered Halo 2's story is, well, Halo 3's story, and how little it did to expand on the good things that Halo 2 brought to the table. Halo 3 begins with, um, well, a very, very tame start when compared to 2. It doesn't help that the beautiful graphics are gone, but that doesn't matter as much as the opening cut and dry introduction. Cortana begins by speaking about how she chose John 117 over all the other Spartans, stating that his natural luck was what attracted her to him. Of course, she got left behind on High Charity, and was last seen talking with the Gravemind at the end of the last game, so we don't really know what's happening with her at this moment. Johnson and the Arbiter have made it to Earth, where it's assumed that the Covenant have started their attack, and the Chief has decided to jump from the incoming ship that they piloted to Earth for some reason locking up his armor and using its embedded impact gel to survive the fall. They make it seem like he's dead for a moment, which, I mean, dude's on the cover of the game. Could you imagine the balls to have Chief dead in the opening scene and you're just now playing as the Arbiter? My god. Regardless, we now begin drudging through the jungle here towards a brute encampment with the Arbiter as our partner, taking that consistent buildup of being part of a unit that was presented in Halo 2 and embellishing on it with someone that you actually grew to know and care about. The gameplay definitely has the largest amount of changes yet. First off, your grenade count goes from four to two of each type, but you'll gain access to four types of grenades instead of two. The incendiary grenades were probably my favorite of the new additions, and seemed like a logical conclusion in terms of cooking up a new type. And I always felt like the spike grenades were fun, but not really different enough to warrant a whole new type of grenade. They're kind of just like a slightly different plasma. But I think that they were more about enforcing the idea that brutes come with their own tech. And the weapons that follow definitely suit the faction well, feeling more primitive but still alien in nature. As such, your first new weapon would be the Spiker. Fundamentally, it's the brute form of the SMG, but in practice it always felt more fun to me than the human SMGs have. That might actually have more to do with how much faster brutes seem to die in Halo 3, which I'm grateful for given the sheer amount of them when compared to 2. Speaking of, you can now use that big-ass hammer that Tartarus had, the Gravity Hammer. It's basically a slower sword, but with a big AoE of killing energy that flows out from it. But the biggest change has got to come in the form of equipment. These completely changed how you could approach a level in Halo, and created quite a shift in how multiplayer worked as well. I always personally liked them, but I knew people who despised them. For now, you gain access to the Bubble Shield, a deployable dome of cover that neither side can shoot through, giving you a safety net while your shield recharges. I'd go through the rest as they come up, but there are 11 different bits of equipment, and it might get disruptive to keep mentioning them as they pop up. I know that hasn't stopped me from mentioning weapons throughout the video, but hey. I have nothing more to say, I just, just hey. The effects range from more damage-focused trip mines, shield drainers, and deployable turrets, to protective equipment like the bubble shield, deployable cover, instant shield regen, and straight-up invincibility, to more utility effects like flashbangs, radar jammers, grav lifts, and the familiar invisibility. It basically took the initial ideas that Bungie placed in the first game with overshields and invisibility pickups and combined them with the Arbiter's on-demand cloaking ability in the second game. Again, something I personally really like, but can completely understand it not being someone's cup of tea. 
As you fight on through a few outlying squads of enemies, Chief will seem to start to lose it as Cortana begins flashing and flickering in his visor, guilting him about leaving her behind. And this is probably the beginning of a string of occurrences that I feel makes Halo 3 narratively weaker in a lot of ways to its predecessors. It's not all that bad, and I'll get to both sides as we continue, but keep this in mind until then. The first level concludes at a facility where the Brutes have taken Johnson and a few other Marines hostage. After bailing them out, a Pelican comes charging in and obliterates the two Phantoms, which just kind of… Uh, take it. One of Halo 3's weakest points is how dumbed down it seems to be when compared to the first two entries. I'll admit it, there are definitely points in both Halo 1 and 2 where I got lost for a moment. Sometimes it would take me a bit to understand where I needed to go, and if I needed to clear a room. But it becomes apparent after a moment of looking around and getting my bearings. Halo 3 came in during the glorious age of waypoints and map markers. And while those waypoints were present occasionally in the previous games, they weren't frequent enough to be disruptive. Halo 3 amps their usage to 11, pushing them into the player's face along with this god-awful faint blue visor outline in a way that makes me feel like the devs thought that their players were morons. It really shouldn't bother me that much, but sometimes it's very obvious where I'm supposed to be going, and the game goes, hey, go here. When paired with even cheesier dialogue than the other two games had, it just makes me feel like, I guess a 2007 Xbox gamer. Break off, now! Watch yourself! Off the thruster, hang on! Ma'am, squad leaders are requesting a rally point. Where should they go? To war. Ma'am, I, I have no idea how to... Uh, that's not gonna... It's like, do you have a rally point or like a... I can't tell them that. They're, they're not gonna know where to go. Even if badass Sergeant Johnson had said that, that would have been an excessively corny line. It doesn't help that the next stage has the prophet of truth going, ha 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 ha, we are on Earth now and you will die. I am the bad guy and you will perish. I can't stress just how jarring it is to go from, hey look, here's the covenant, here's how they're structured, here's how they think. These ones are the priests who lord over their subjects. They're well-spoken and their deceit is top-notch. To, Here's the Covenant bad guy, and he's very angry. He will taunt you to show you how mad he is. Also, the Arbiter is here now and doesn't have any dialogue about how he went from a religious extremist to standing against everything he used to care about. He's just the cool alien friend. Hell yeah. I don't know, it's a rough start, I guess. Halo, its divine wind will rush through the stars, propelling all who are worthy along the path to salvation. Let him know. Ah, all of you vermin, cowering in the dirt, thinking, what? I wonder, that you might escape the coming fire? No. The human that killed the prophet of regret. Who was it? Who do you think? The demon is here? <laughs> Why? Looking for a little payback? Retrieving the icon is my only concern. <laughs> burn until its surface is but glass. Does he usually mention me? I will say that the way that others view the Chief has shifted from them treating him as a good soldier that other soldiers are relatively happy about, to him being a hero who instills a sense of victory and good fortune into all troops that you seem to encounter. They hoop and holler a lot more upon seeing you. They remark that they're going to make it. Stuff like that. Which is kind of cool just because at this stage, the Chief is a hero. One who's waded through the darkest depths that the galaxy has to offer and has come out the other side victorious. The Arbiter, on the other hand, will occasionally try to talk sense into random Covenant troops like drones, doing his best to get them to give up while shooting holes in them. And by occasionally, I mean that he does this one time, I think. Unless I just missed him doing it again. This entire stage is a bunker that the humans plan on abandoning and blowing up now that the Covenant have begun to assault it, which… Uh, seems to be the MO for humanity in these games. This means helping the staff here to evacuate, which revolves around killing a lot of fucking Covenant. It's almost like we defend the thing successfully for most of the mission before abandoning it. This game's heroic mode is a lot easier than Halo 2's, though the second game has always been the outlier in difficulty to be fair but brutes fall a lot easier as mentioned before. 
Drones do as well, but there's a lot more of them in a swarm. Jackals will use carbines sometimes instead of snipers, making them more fair when they're scattered throughout the level. It just feels a lot more balanced, but there are also times after coming off of the last game where I go, okay, how the fuck did I survive that? One addition that I've always loved is the ability to dismount turrets from their stands and walk around with them as miniguns. I'm not sure how much sense it makes, but it looks cool. It usually got me killed in Legendary, but it's a lot more fun in lower difficulties. So after getting everyone out, it turns out that the brutes have disarmed the bomb. Well, that won't do, we gotta blow this fucking place up. You don't understand, we need this place to explode. So Keyes sends the chief back in through minimal resistance to rearm the thing and then try to escape. Seems like a good risk for a reward that might kill a small platoon or two of Covenant. Throughout this endeavor, Chief has more senior moments as visions of Cortana continue to slow him down. By now she's gone from flashback types of lines to quoting the Gravemind directly back on Delta Halo, indicating that something is obviously wrong. Now that we've made it out, the next two missions have us directly attempting to assault the Prophet of Truth's forces, who have landed right back at New Mombasa and have begun to dig there again. Turns out that the key to the so-called Ark is what's buried here, again pointing towards humanity as being the successors to the Forerunners in some caliber. We hit a couple of Warthog sections which are broken up by a brief stint of running and gunning. <laughs> Along the way we encounter one of the new brute vehicles, the Chopper. Which again, I really appreciate the Brutes incorporating their own arsenal into the Covenant, because it implies that maybe the Elites brought their own gear when they joined and so on. After making it to the area where an anti-air gun has been keeping our forces at bay, we take on plenty of vehicles while bringing in vehicles of our own. This time we have the Mongoose in addition to the Warthog, which has always looked silly when they have a guy with a rocket launcher on the back. It helps that the Marines have precision accuracy with the things and it actually makes this part of the mission rather fun. The culmination of these two missions end with us taking out a Scarab tank, and then the AA gun. This Scarab seems to have diverted from its original mining purpose and is straight up a war machine, which does seem like the natural evolution after seeing the mining platform's capabilities. To take it down, you wind up using a missile launcher, weakening its legs before you scale it and take it out from the inside. The entire second stage of these two stages is pretty damn fun, though I have to say that I had hoped for Earth to be more... Earth-like? I mean, yeah, it's the future and all that, and you can see shades of Earth and all the highways and whatnot, but something about seeing the Forerunner Dreadnought embedded in the Earth in this strange, perfect circle with no trace of ruined buildings or the like, I just, I don't know, it just kinda looks like more Halo. Getting to the AA gun has the game telling you to shoot the glowing core as you're shooting the glowing core, uh, which is helpfully accentuated by an arrow to tell you that you're doing a good job. When it's destroyed, the UNSC forces begin their assault on the Forerunner ship, before it unleashes a huge beam of light, creating some kind of gravity well or slip space portal that disables and begins vacuuming in the UNSC ships. The Arbiter screams out like a Wookiee, further driving home the point that the guy's a fucking mascot now. But he certainly did something. At the same time, a flood-infested Covenant cruiser slips into Earth's atmosphere because we missed these guys. And we're at the halfway point of the game, if you can believe that shit. I mean, the amount of stuff that we've actually accomplished at this stage is next to nothing when compared to what we got done by this point in the previous games. So it's back through all of the stuff that we just fought through, except that the Flood are wholly different than they were in the previous entries. Yes, of course, the standard stuff is still there, but now we have Brute variants which will nearly always charge at you. And you have a variety of pure forms which are created solely from flood and no other biomass. These include the stalkers which will crawl around and transform into other forms when threatened. Then you have the tank form which are these hulking beasts with tons of health. And finally you have the ranged form which fire projectiles at you from afar with seemingly infinite ammo. And all of this makes the flood so much more dangerous than they used to be. Whereas you might clear out a room before moving on to the next, you're now almost always going to be on the run to some degree. Oh, and the Grape Mind talks through them now, speaking in veiled threats and odd riddles as it always has. I do gotta say that it would have been nice if this could only happen if the Grape Mind was in the nearby vicinity, 
but I also think that backtracking through this level feels completely new when there's so much more enemy variety up front. Along the way, you can pick up a flamethrower, which you would think would be a great weapon for combating these fuckers. But then they charge at you while also being on fire. So yeah, not so great. The elites eventually drop in to join your resistance, now completely setting aside their differences to help drive the flood back while you head to the crashed cruiser to, um, uh, blow it up, I guess. What can't be solved by blowing shit up? You've now got two voices in your head as Cortana warns you that High Charity is on its way to Earth and will most certainly be filled to the brim with flood. The other voice is the Grape Mind, of course, which tries to lull you into giving up and surrendering to its embrace. Making it to the center of the cruiser has you not blowing it up. In fact, you don't even fight anything, which I always thought was weird. You instead grab what you think is Cortana, but is only a message from her that somehow got onto the ship. The message details a plan that she cooked up to stop the flood while also not using Halo. Though she can only explain that going through the big portal that Truth created is the key here. Then she starts collapsing in pain and potential corruption, which I always found to be kind of, um, uh, silly. I mean, I guess she's a true AI, so she feels emotions and pain and all of that, but I never understood how the Flood would corrupt her or hurt her in any way. It just seems like the writers wanted to focus primarily on Cortana and Chief's relationship for this game, and it falls flat almost constantly with the interruptions from her. At this stage, Spark has decided to join you once again as an ally, deciding that since you blew up its installation, it may as well do everything in its power to help you since you're a human. I wonder why it waited this long. And with that, the elites in the UNSC truly merge, a brief cutscene showcasing the odd relationship that these two factions now have while waiting for orders. The shipmaster for the elites here seems to be the Spec Ops commander from the previous game since his armor and missing mandible seem to be the same but he was never given a name, so it's hard to tell for sure. Regardless, this moment of unity does feel good after playing on each side in Halo 2, and the plan seems to be to send a smaller force through the portal and onto the original installation of the Halo rings while the elites and the rest of the UNSC hang back to defend Earth. Arriving on Installation 00 is almost like a reset to the game thematically, and follows the footsteps of the previous games in that you're on another strange world filled with Covenant forces. No wildlife, of course, but definitely brutes, grunts, and jackals. You start out with a bit of sniping and then move towards a vehicle section with a group of marines. Nothing bad, just good old Halo as you know it. I will say that there's something particularly satisfying about using the chopper to take down brutes. For some reason, they can never seem to do anything about it. I mean, it's like they genuinely don't know how to behave when I start spinning around them. Oh, and also they have these sleds that slide around the dunes here. They're called Prowlers, but I don't really believe in them as real vehicles, so I'm not gonna call them that. Despite me not being a big fan of vehicle-based stages, I do have to say that this one has a great level layout and plenty of ways to change your playstyle. It's easily the most fun level in the game in that regard because I can approach it however I want. Plus, clearing the LZ for Keys' ship to come barreling in and drop off a load of tanks is always a really damn cool scene. I've had this dialogue in my head for over 16 years, it's time to pass the torch. This goes on for a while and has you taking out tons of wraiths, ghosts, choppers, and another scarab tank as you wind up piloting a warthog with a gauss cannon attached to it. Again, great for NPCs to operate it since they don't tend to miss. When you make it into the facility here, Spark begins excitedly analyzing what's going on here with this installation, now formally introduced as the Ark. When the Forerunners built these constructs, they realized that all it would take is the Flood capturing one of their monitors for them to learn everything. So they limited the knowledge that each one had to the installation that they were monitoring. This means that Spark only knows slightly more than we do about the Ark, and it quickly realizes that the Prophet of Truth is at the core of this installation, attempting to interfere with its inner workings. Chewbacca then calls out to us, realizing that the Covenant have sent reinforcements to our location. Did you know that brutes die in three melee hits with full armor? Isn't that wacky? I think jackals take four. Anyways, a bunch of brutes start trying to adopt elite tactics into their regimen. The problem is that they aren't very good at it. First, they'll try out cloaking, which they immediately defeat the purpose of by yelling and firing. 
Then they try the jump packs, which... A lot of them just fling themselves off the side of this structure. I know it probably isn't coded that way, but man, it's funny to think that they're just trying everything now and completely failing at using shit that they aren't used to. The next stage begins with another very Halo-ish environment. The difference is that the swarm of pelicans are now joined by Covenant ships which have been spray-painted a metallic green, which I always thought was really fun. It's little things like that that make me want to see what's going on in the background. And I do think that including small scenes detailing this new alliance would have gone a long way to making the game's story stand out more. Our objective here is to, um, well, disable three generators to take down a barrier that Truth has put up. It's an objective unlike anything we've seen out of these games. When you land, you're immediately equipped with your final new bit of UNSC weaponry, the Spartan Laser. It's got a charge time, but it shoots a giant fucking laser. What's not to love? I have to say that going back to the original Halo, I think every weapon was wholly different in usage, how they operate, and why you would want to use them over the other ones. I mean, designing weapons that all have their own identities is tough, and I think that started to become clear as early as Halo 2. You have the Brute Plasma Rifle that's really just an Elite Plasma Rifle, but red. You have the Beam Rifle that's just a Covenant Sniper. You have the Fuel Rod Cannon that's just the Covenant Rocket Launcher and all of those work just as well as their human counterparts. But then you had dual wielding, the brute shot, the battle rifle and carbine, and they all added some variety to your gun options. At this stage, Halo 3 is very obviously running low on new ideas in the weapons realm, instead focusing new creativity on equipment and being able to detach mounted guns. But outside of those, the Spartan laser is just another launcher type and the brute weapons can all be compared to existing weapons. And I kind of got to respect that. Instead of just sticking in another machine gun, another single shot rifle, another burst rifle, another pistol, etc., the devs went, nah, this is good, and just focused on adding some complementary brute variants to the existing arsenal. I've always enjoyed when an FPS doesn't dilute its weapons pool. I think it makes for a better game, usually. So anyways, generator deactivation. On our way to the first one, we're given a brief recap. You know, just in case we forgot what the fuck was going on while we breathed through our mouths. The Spark believes Truth can activate the rings at any time. If he does, Earth, every being in the galaxy, Halo will kill them all. Oh, is that what's happening? Ah, oh, I got distracted looking at the funny glowing men on screen. So yeah, pretty standard stuff through the generators. The Arbiter takes out the second one, thankfully, but Johnson gets captured at his, which means we gotta hit the last one as well. I gotta say, the idea of chasing one of the Prophets of the Covenant from Earth to an installation related to Halo, and then having Johnson get captured by the Covenant has never been done before. So hats off to these guys for this string of ideas. Thankfully, the trip over involves piloting a Hornet, which I've always enjoyed. They're kinda like little hovering versions of Covenant Banshees, but with guided missiles and machine turrets. After deactivating the last generator, High Charity comes smoldering into the region, meaning that the Flood have arrived. We've missed these guys. The last bit of new weaponry comes in the form of the Brute, um... What's this thing called? I always called it the Brute Shotgun. Ah, the Mauler. The Mauler is the better version of the UNSC shotgun solely because it kills most of the bigger Flood in one or two shots, which is a lot better than the shotgun in this game. It's like the primary reason to use the damn thing in my book. At this point, Spark realizes that the Ark is outside of the range of Halo's death beam and goes into a panic over it. But that shouldn't matter even slightly since it was never meant to kill the Flood. I guess the theory is that the Flood might be able to jump to other galaxies from here, but I feel like they always had the potential for that with the technology that they have at their disposal. Regardless, the final rush to the core of this thing involves another Scorpion into Hornet sequence, taking out more Scarabs and a load of other Covenant vehicles. There's a lot more focus on vehicular combat in this game, but it feels really good because you have people fighting alongside you as well. It makes Halo go from the one-man army feeling and actually takes it back to the developer's original intent of creating a squad-based RTS type of game in a lot of ways. I guess you could also go play Halo Wars, but this is the closest to that while also still retaining the series' FPS roots. When we make it inside, a scene plays out where Johnson is getting slapped around by Truth's Brute. They need him to activate this thing also, which means that we never needed to come here because we supplied Truth with a human by doing so. 
I guess he could have kidnapped some humans before coming here, which would have been the better play. Actually, that would have been a really dark way to go if the writers were thinking about it. Like, Truth kidnaps a bunch of humans and is trying to convince one of them to activate the Ark. When one of them refuses, he kills them and then goes on to the next. Or hell, you could have had it so that one of your objectives was literally blowing up a ship of humans as the Arbiter. You don't send any humans in, instead just having the elites do the dirty work. How fucked would that have been? Instead, we go back to the space opera kind of thing, having Johnson deliver his one-liners while trying to get the brute to accidentally kill him. Here comes Keys alone, by herself, with no backup. She crashes her ship, gets out with a shotgun, and is immediately surrounded by brutes. She goes to kill Johnson and then herself, but she can't manage to do it. Whoops. Do it. Me. And you. Now. No! And that's all it takes for Johnson to become despondent and stop resisting, which... Uh, there was a point where the writers wanted Johnson and Keyes to be intimate, but um, they pulled back from that. Would have made a whole lot more sense if they had been intimate given what happens here. Actually, it's really weird that they weren't with this outcome. Arby and the Chief come up the elevator right as these rings start lighting up, indicating the firing sequence has started. And Gravemind stops them before their charge, claiming that he's willing to help out to stop this whole thing from happening. So your charge to truth winds up weirdly enough being alongside the Flood for the first time. Which is bittersweet, because on one hand, shit's cool. On the other, you know that you're literally creating more enemies for the way out. When you make it to the end, Truth is already infected, his troops dead. The Arbiter has his one moment where he seems to be, well, the elite that we came to know in Halo 2, and he silences Truth at last, before giving one more Wookiee screech and reverting back to the dipshit that we've gotten to know in this game. Chief deactivates the rings, causing Gravemind to wriggle its tentacles up, laughing like a comic book villain. The Arbiter makes sure to let us know what happened for the Call of Duty players in the back. Betrayed one villain for another. I can see why your master trusts you, little one. And then we have to escape. Johnson gets out fine, but these two get knocked off the pelican and have to hoof it back through the Ark. Which is tough, but manageable on Heroic. I'm a thief, but I keep what I steal. Not now, bitch. It's Chana the Dead out here. Turns out Cortana's plan involved, um... Having the chief see visions of her floating to a window. The window reveals that a replacement ring was made for this exact moment that a ring got destroyed. And that thing can be used to cause a local explosion that will wipe out any and all life on the installation. And since High Charity is now here with the Grave Mind on it, well, it seems like the perfect plan. It just happened to fall into place. I've never quite understood how Halo could destroy all life besides the Flood specifically, but in this case, I guess it can apparently be repurposed to destroy all life, period. Maybe the Flood being so adaptive would mean that there would be some form of it floating around even after a death laser. But if that's the case, there's gotta be more of it out there even beyond High Charity, like on Earth, or the other Halo rings, or a billion other places. I don't know, don't think too hard about it, I guess. Our second to last stage has the Chief heading into High Charity to try to retrieve Cortana before lighting the fuse on the replacement ring. I'm getting antsy over here, it's been a long fucking time since we've blown shit up, you know. So this stage is complete ass, but it's kind of supposed to be. I mean, you're heading through goopy flesh tunnels that have completely overrun High Charity. It's also the loudest damn stage in terms of non-stop noise pollution. It's just madness in every sense. But it also means that I don't feel like fighting, I just want to get in and out as fast as I can. I do have to say that if the devs meant for the Flood to be an enemy that you feel next to hopeless fighting, then they definitely hit the nail on the head because I think I fired my shotgun once along the path to Cortana. And going fast makes the level that much more annoying. Because along the way you'll have both Cortana freaking out and the Gravemind with its own variety of losing its shit which means you'll keep slowing down to a crawl every 10 to 30 seconds. Child of my enemy, why have you come? <laughs> of course you came for her. And yet, perhaps a part of her remains. Time has taught me 
patience! I have walked the edge of the abyss. There will be no more sadness. I don't know, I, I've just never been a fan of Cortana being corrupted by alien biomass, but it is what it is. When you grab her, a heartwarming scene plays out at the very least, where she references several lines from previous games. And you hear some semblance of emotion play out in Chief's voice for once. Got an escape plan? Thought I'd try shooting my way out. Mix things up a little. It's cute, and there's really nothing wrong with it. I guess I just think of AI differently as all. But I do get it. So on our way out, Cortana suggests blowing the place up. Fucking finally. The only issue is, um, well, you remember how massive High Charity actually was? Like the whole city's below, the light bridge is connecting everything, all of that? Well, first off, this looks nothing like that now. In fact, it looks closer to the truth and reconciliation, if anything. But even setting that aside, you're telling me that we could have opened up four sprockets, fired out four grenades, and blown up the entirety of High Charity the whole time? Come on. I guess this is the problem when you want to blow everything up, but you don't think about what that might imply. The final mission begins on Halo, of all places, if you'll believe it. This installation's weather is still a work in progress, but everything looks very familiar to the first game, which is kind of fun in its own right. As you climb towards one of its many triangular structures, the flood begin to drop in and assault you en masse. It's one of the tougher climbs and actually required me to begin fighting slowly up to the top of this thing. I have managed to get lucky with my run buys in the past, but that wasn't cutting it for me this time. After being let in by Spark, it seems finally truly content to be doing what it was built to do. That changes very quickly when it claims that it would take several days to prepare this installation for firing. Johnson replies that we don't have that kind of time, and Spark states that if Halo fires now, it'll destroy the Ark. We don't give a shit about that, and Johnson begins to light the fuse anyway. Did you know that 343 Guilty Spark comes equipped with a death laser? Neither did literally anyone else at any point in time across any game until this very moment. Yeah, this thing fires off three successive death beams at our crew here and begins a sudden boss battle. Spark is now a floating orb of death, and it constantly pushes you away with great force while shooting more beams at you. You take it out with a Spartan laser that Johnson had on him, and that's that. If you can believe it, the guy who somehow survived the first Halo explosion dies to a tiny floating orb of metal. Even to this day, I never understood this decision. That is, until I listened to those developer diaries that I've been inserting throughout this video. See, to me, Spark is a funny little comic relief character who is more mischievous than dangerous. Yes, it's done some annoying shit, but I've always viewed it as more of an easter egg in the later games. And that's really my own fault because it's been pretty pivotal to parts of these plots. But I've never been able to look at it like a fleshed out character despite its story arc taking it through different states of helpfulness, betrayal, and purpose. Because it's a fucking AI inside of a small floating shell. But the developers didn't see it that way. They loved Spark, just as they love Cortana. So while this whole event was downright stupid to me, I have to admit that I might just not be the target audience for this particular twist. So if you loved this stint of writing alongside Cortana's freakout and all of that, then that's awesome, and I'm glad that you liked this part of the series. For me, it was a complete miss. The best thing to come out of this is Spark suddenly revealing that humanity is Forerunner's choice for passing the torch, which is obvious if you've been keeping up, but still nice to hear spelled out bluntly. I am sorry, Spark, but come. Yeah, sorry your mom died, but we gotta get to 7 Eleven stat. Brrr. The last leg has us finding Johnson's warthog and driving it out in a big escape sequence as this place explodes. Again, the originality points are popping here, god damn. I've always thought that a ghost would be the more fun vehicle to take out of here, but um, I get the uh, throwback to the first game, I guess. When you make it, a scene ensues showing the Arbiter being smart and running up to the cockpit of the ship. Meanwhile, the Chief stays back with Cortana in the cargo bay. Afterwards, the ship crashes in Earth's waters, with only the Arbiter emerging. A memorial takes place on the hills outside of New Mombasa, with pictures of the dead adorning a tombstone of sorts. Lord Hood, oh yeah, this guy's name is Lord Hood. Killer name. Lord Hood goes, I cannot believe the Master Chief, he is dead. 
But then the Master Chief is not dead. Master Chief is alive and on other half of ship. Okay, fine, it was cool at the time. Because you thought that you just fucking died off camera, but then in the post credits, it turns out that the ship got cut in two when escaping through the portal that snapped closed. And with that, the Master Chief climbs inside a stasis pod, heading to sleep and ending the series in the same state that he began in. Wake me when you need me. You know, I always had fond memories of Halo 3's story. I always had it in my head that it was a great conclusion to an epic trilogy that spanned six short years. And in many ways, it was. The Covenant and the Flood were defeated for now. Humanity lived to see another day the infection on Earth contained. The Arbiter went off with the other elites to their home planet, free from the yolk of the Covenant's lies. But just like Halo 2, so many story beats are identical to the first game. And this time it's worse because of how few new things that Halo 3 brings to the table. With 2, you got to see first-hand lore being pushed out into the story. You saw how the Covenant was structured and the birth of a civil war that resulted in the death of this mighty faction. You played both sides, gained insight on both perspectives. Halo 3 has nothing like that. The enemy hasn't changed, your perspective on any faction hasn't been altered, and any buildup that started with the Arbiter is cast aside for focus solely on humanity's point of view. The fact of the matter is that Halo 3 takes all of the good stuff that arose from Halo 2's plot and just wholesale disregards it. I mean, sure, it puts a bow on the franchise and that was fine enough. But the thing that made 2 as good as it was was that it referenced a lot of the structuring of Halo 1 while adding much more to give it its own identity. Halo 3 just goes, hey, you remember when you did this? Over and over, while bringing nothing new to the table. If Halo 1's story was exactly as good as I remembered, and Halo 2 was better in some parts and worse in others, 3 is worse overall. But what about the gameplay? Halo Combat Evolved revolutionized the genre, and it still holds up to this day. Is it a little slower and bulkier at times? Yeah, of course. But it's still a great game with only a few minor things holding it back. The weapons were all well thought out and added their own flair. The vehicles were a good enough start. The stage design was well done and focused on terrain and buildings, even if it got a bit repetitive. And the enemies were absolutely stellar with how they behaved and interacted with you, the environment, and themselves. It's a masterpiece even to this day. Halo 2 took that as a base and fleshed out the gameplay to be snappier and more modernized. Enemies have even more behaviors. New weapons bring more ways to play to the table. Vehicles are totally revamped to be much more fun to pilot and maneuver. It was just an upgrade in every way. And Halo 3 for me is actually the most fun to play of them all. Vehicular combat is at an all-time high, as is the behavior of the Flood in particular. There are some issues with brute behavior and how slow and confused they seem to be when compared to 2, but the addition of equipment, the speed of the gameplay, and the higher jumping and lack of fall damage all made for a really fun game to play, and was always my personal favorite for online multiplayer. Bungie had a vision with Halo one that had very, very strong roots. Unfortunately, I feel like they were discouraged either by themselves, by others, or just due to time constraints when it came to executing in later entries. It felt like they really only knew how to follow the same kind of story over and over, despite all of the fun ideas cooking up in the background with books and spin-offs. They created a vibrant, inspired universe filled with amazing concepts and creative factions. But when it came time to do something with all of it, they wound up telling nearly the same base story three times in a row. There's nothing wrong with referencing your own work. In fact, that's where a lot of great moments come from in these games. But when you follow the same formula over and over, it takes all of that buildup and unique creativity and stifles it instead of birthing something new. It would be like if Dragon Age Origins had the Blight start, and then the Archdemon attacks Denerim, and then the hero kills it. Then Dragon Age 2 had another Blight start. And then the Archdemon attacks Kirkwall. And then the hero kills it. And then Inquisition had another Blight start. And then the Archdemon attacks Orle. And then the hero kills it. Why not have the Prophet of Regret jump straight to High Charity and make Halo 2 about fighting through the Covenant's home turf? Maybe the Arbiter joins you, gets his revenge, and takes control of the Covenant after exposing the High Prophet's lies. Maybe Halo 3 has a splinter group of brute outcasts infiltrate Earth and spin up the Ark, while the Flood corrupts Spark the same way that they did Cortana and use it to infiltrate and infect High Charity. 
The humans deal with the brutes while following the same path that Halo 3 took, more or less, and the Arbiter makes a decision to evacuate as many uninfected sectors of high charity as he can before piloting the ship into a nearby star or something equivalent. I mean, that's just off the top of my head, and even that storyline would need some editing to work out in a satisfactory way. But it is at least different, and I think that's what was missing from these games. The drive to strive away from something that's already been done. Regardless, the original trilogy is still great. It opened my eyes to first-person shooters in a way that they hadn't been before. And if gameplay was always the top priority, Bungie absolutely crushed it in an immensely satisfying way. These guys had a vision, one that carried them from relatively known to superstars. I can safely say that they affected the games industry in a positive way, and their past passions are still felt even today. Thanks for watching. I had a great time revisiting these games from my youth and would love to hit the spin offs and the 343 games at some point. Until then, though, I have merch over at my merch shop. None of it is Halo related, but hey, it's gaming related. I think. I have a Twitch where I stream nearly every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. I have a Twitter where I tweet out my new videos usually. I have a Discord where people chat about random bullshit in the meantime. And I have a Patreon. And that's it. Have a good one.